city, uh, it is a study session. It's October 6, 2020. Can we go ahead and start with roll call, please? Mayor Bagley? I am here. Council Member Christensen? Council Member Adalgo Faring? Here. Council Member Martin? Here. Council Member Peck? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez? Here. And Council Member Waters? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Great. Don't hate me, Dr. Waters, but would you like to uh, lead us in the pledge, given you and you probably have the most experience in pledges? Uh, maybe, maybe Susie, you know, Council Member Doggo Faring could give you a run, but let's let's do her next. I'm one. happy to defer if she'd like to if she'd like to lead this. No, no, I'd really I insist. You go ahead. <laughs> I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag to the, of the United, United States, States of America. Of America. Of America. And to, to the, the republic, republic, republic for, for which, which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation, nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. All right, great. So, how do musicians and stuff do this? The, I don't know. You, you, I, you can get an entire like basketball stadium to say "air ball, air ball" like in unison, but Dr. Waters couldn't even get us to do the pledge. I, I just don't get it. You know, Councilmember Martin, very good engineers. Very good engineers. And with music. And with music. Why don't you try singing next time, Tim? <laughs> I think that might work. All right, let's go ahead and uh, remind everybody that anybody wishing to provide public comment uh, needs to go ahead and watch the live stream of the meeting and call in only when uh, the meeting for public comment is open. Um, callers are not able to access the meeting at any other time. The toll-free number there on your screen, uh, 888-788-0099. Um, those instructions will, will be posted again. Oh. My German shepherd apparently likes to pull, pull, pull wires out of my ears. I apologize. All right, then um, let's go ahead and move on to uh, motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items. <coughs> Councilman Martin. Uh, yes, last week um, we directed staff to uh, um, fund Longmont Public Media at level two and um, uh, having, having looked at the discretionary budget stuff and sort of assessed the way people feel, I was in the affirmative prevailing side on that and I would like to first make a motion to reconsider that allocation of funds. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right, we have a motion and second. So a motion's on the table. Um, is there further debate before we vote? All right, all in favor of the motion to reconsider, um, say aye. 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 Um, those opposed say nay. Nay. All right, the motion carries six to one. Uh, Councilmember Martin? Yes, I would like to then move that we fund Longmont Public Media at level one. Okay. I'll second. All right. Could I, could, could, we, could I add a friendly amendment? Go ahead. Floor is yours, and then we're going to go with Joan. Joan, you're next. I saw your hand go up. I think the term is, op, we ought to, it ought to be option rather than level one, I think. Oh, excuse me. Yes, option one. Okay, Councilmember Peck? Did you have something I, to add? I can't remember what option one was. Can somebody tell me what that was? It was the um, highest level of funding, which would allow them um, to uh, do some expansions of their services in terms of, of public service productions. Didn't we have some kind of a report from Jim Golden that it would have to come out of one-time funding? Am I remembering that correctly? Jim, you want to help us out? Uh, yeah, actually, either level was coming from one-time funding. Uh, level one, option one, <laughs> is uh, 117000 And I think option two is 70, 76000 And Jim, how much money do we have in that one-time funding? Well, you have, you have more than that. So let's, let's leave it at that. And next week, we will be bringing to you options, you know, what you have to still direct. So... Councilman Waters found that very amusing. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that he did. Uh, that was a perfect response, Jim. I would have expected <laughs> nothing less. Councilmember Christensen? 
Well, I would love to fund them with that, but I also would love to give the library some extra money, give our early childhood education some extra money. Um, you know, I, I just, I think it's very difficult to um, favor one organization over others at a time when we are having to cut back so much on other areas. But if, if the council thinks that's fine, then I'm for it too. But I, I, I just think that in a time when we have so much other material, uh, so many other organizations that we have to cut, it's really difficult for me to uh, okay this one organization. But I, uh, even though I do think they're doing very, very well and I do want them to expand, um, I just think that this is not the time to give them uh, extra money, but that's my opinion. Mayor, maybe I, maybe I should be more specific with my answer. I'm sorry, I didn't have it in front of me. So I thought it was that simple, but anyhow, um, so I'll give you um, a few different sources of one-time dollars that we've identified. Uh, we, we do have our assessed valuations. So uh, the amounts that would be available from that would be about $170,000. Uh, there's 50% of the special marijuana tax, which is $205,000. There's the first, the 50% of last year's, uh, the first year marijuana tax, which was undesignated is $137,000. So all of those are available. And then we talked about uh, over um, 1.4 million, I believe we said was going into the, um, stability reserve and we talked about that potentially being lowered to whatever amount and using that dollar whatever it is lowered by if if necessary for other one-time expenses so that's what i meant by you have more <laughs> right councilmember peck and councilmember martin thank you jim and that's why i asked that question so having that information i will support this councilmember martin Yes. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about this is, is that LPM, I think, uh, other than probably some of the other organizations that could benefit from additional funding, um, have a firm plan for how to actually have this be a one-time expense. And that taken together with what I think has been extraordinary ser uh, service during, uh, you know, in terms of, of communication services for the city um, makes me think that we need to encourage them to be able to stay on plan to the extent that they are able, given that they're not able to open up their facilities and, and uh, build up makerspace funding yet. So, um, you know, that's, that's the reason why I think that uh, we need to make sure that this resource stays intact for the city, and I would have voted for this last time, except that I wasn't sure that there was support for it. All right, Councilmember Christensen. Um, okay, so I don't know. That, <coughs> I I presume this will probably pass, but um, I I would suggest that if we do this, we take uh, thirty five thousand dollars out of the council contingency fund because that'll be only till the end of this year and then it will be, we hope, refurbished. Um, <laughs> is that right, Jim? Um, and the rest uh, out of the 50% um, of the marijuana uh, tax because it's now 450,000 as opposed to 250,000 last year. So this will not diminish presumably our ability to help fund housing uh, and human services, which helped us provide additional vouchers for homeless people and also helped us fund early childhood education to a, a, a greater degree. I don't want to impact those funds. I also don't think we should be taking out the reserve fund when we really need a reserve and we need to continue along the path of building up that reserve, which we've been doing for the last uh, eight years. So or six years, anyway. 
We've got, we've got, I guess my thoughts are that I just prefer that, I mean, I agree with the, I mean, the, the point of what council member Christensen just said, but I just say we leave it up to Harold and Jim and they'll let us know and we can transfer money at any time. It's left to right hand repeater, Paul, all that stuff. But uh, we've got a motion on the table. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. It passes unanimously. Is that it, Councilman Martin? Yes, that's all I have. All right, Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I do have a couple of uh, things that I wanted to direct staff to do. They're pretty easy, won't take much time. So I would like uh, to direct staff to give us an update on the Part 16 lawsuit uh, for FAA and uh, how that affects mile high skydiving, where we are with that. Um, so I move to direct staff to give us an update on the part 16 uh, lawsuit with FAA. Um, I guess the only reason I'm not seconding that Joan is because a lot of times, uh, a lot of times individual council members want information and we all have the ability to, to, to talk with staff. And so- uh, Council, uh, Mayor Badley, this is not just for uh, Council, it is for the residents as well. They want to know where we are on this, and uh, we should update people on where we are on our lawsuits, what's going on. This is an issue that the res that the population is interested in. Yeah, so um, it, it would be a very short update. Uh, I can ask Harold uh, about it, mm -hmm. but then I'd have to email everybody who's asking me. So let's just have him do it publicly. Councilmember Christensen. I would second that. Okay. I guess the, uh, I'm, I'm gonna vote for it, but just so everybody knows, we're gonna be talk, hearing from Harold tonight uh, during his uh, city manager update and staff has too much to do and we have too much to deal with on Tuesday nights. So at May some point, Mayor. go ahead, Eugene. Uh, Eugene May, city attorney. Uh, so the update on the part 16 is that the FAA granted themselves another extension on September 8th to October 9th. Thank you. And we've been waiting for that decision for, I think, over about a year. I knew it would be a short statement. Thank Perfect. you. Eugene. There we go. Eugene, you just rescued, you rescued me and staff. Thank you. Anything else, Councilmember Peck? No, thank you. All right. All right. Seeing nothing else, let's move on to... Um, Her, uh, Harold, where is your city manager report? I go after I go after public invited to um, be heard on. Uh, all right, so no what I, I see the COVID nineteen, but we're just going to do all of them with that. So let's go ahead and do yep. public invited to be heard. Let's take a two minute break real quick as we get people in the queue. Be right back.
how are we all doing on getting back? And can we, uh, there we go. All right, let's go ahead and start. How many are in the, how many are in the queue? Looks like we're waiting on this yet. It is Heather who's emceeing, but it looks like we have four in the queue right now, Mayor. Perfect. You want to start calling them in? Ready, please? Yes. Thank you. Guest number 499, would you please um, unmute? And you can you hear me? We can. And you'll have okay. three. Uh, if you would just state your name and address uh, for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. Okay, um, my name is Doe Kelly. I live on Barberry Drive in Longmont. Okay, so first I'd like to applaud the council's decision to hold a study session on the proposed smart meter program for Longmont. I would like to know in the October 20th study session, will you also um, plan to invite an independent expert in the damaging health effects of wireless electromagnetic radiation? And if you haven't planned to do so, why not? Um, would you do so? Will you do so? And also, will the public have the opportunity to be interactive in this session other than in um, public invited to, to be heard public uh, commentary? Um, I would also like to ask, in arriving at a budget for the AMI, have you financially considered and incorporated in the AMI proposed budget the potential liability impacts to the city for adverse health impacts or damage by fire that are sparked by a smart meter? As you all know, we are in a severe drought situation at the present moment. Large swaths of California and Colorado burn as we speak, and now through October the 10th is Fire Prevention Week, with this in mind, I urge you to consider the following. It is common knowledge and fully supported by evidence, peer-reviewed and published research, science, and facts, that smart utility meters, including all advanced metering infrastructure or AMI, electronic utility meters, and all utility meters which contain any digital or electronic components whatsoever, are fire hazards due to a lack of surge protectors in violation of necessary standards for utility meters. They cannot withstand typical grid surges. They cause damage to or destroy homes, lives, and structures when damaged by grid surges spark a fire. They emit biologically harmful pulsed EMF radiation continually, whether transmitting data or not. They create and collect personal data of private activities in the home in violation of law. They allow for sharing of data of personal living habits with utility personnel and others without authorization of the property owner or its occupants. They're able to fatally disrupt and disable medical devices such as pacemakers. They cause heating and antenna effects within metallic body implants, including metal in the mouth, damaging bodily tissues. They interfere with bodily functions such as sleep and interfere with the general health and well-being of biological entities in a household when installed in close proximity. The longevity of smart meters is questionable when compared with their analog counterparts, causing for more, much more frequent replacements than analog equipment, resulting in added financial burdens on customers. And last but not least, there are many, many reports of people receiving greatly increased and highly inaccurate utility bills when smart meters are installed. As an individual with ES or electrosensitivity who stands to be more damaged by the installation of said AMI, I ask you, my elected representatives in the city of Longmont, to deeply and fully consider these fire safety and health issues before embarking on any full-scale rollout of AMI. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for your service.
Number 418, I just asked you to unmute. If you would please state your name and address for the record, and then you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, is this uh, Stan Poole? Is, is this the, the, am I the right person? Stan, you're the right guy. Go ahead, buddy. Uh, okay. Um, so the reason I'm calling is that uh, you're considering the uh, ordinance basically to um, confiscate my home and to put my put myself in jail. And one of the things is is that I'm not sure a lot of people in my situation are really aware that this is something that that is threatening them right now. And most of them cannot participate in these meetings. So I don't think this meeting uh, can act, you know, is can be considered an open record meeting when the people who are being affected by it for the most part can't access it. Well, myself, it took me a couple of months to figure out how to do this thing. Um, and the other thing I'm saying is that you know, you're doing something against a certain set of Lawnmont residents, and you're not involving them in the process. I myself, you know, being aware of what's happening in the city, have beat my head trying to get some sort of access to have some sort of input uh, in this thing. And there appears to be a lot of not good knowledge amongst a lot of the city council and the people putting this ordinance together. Like they're saying, oh, we're going to help you get a place to live. I would like to inform you that I was the one who provided information to the state legislator about the city of Lawnmont having extreme difficulties with Section 8 discrimination, where people who had vouchers like myself could not get places to live because of discrimination. I would think maybe you should just try to get fewer people living on the street by allowing them to actually get housing uh, free from discrimination. And the other thing I don't think you've thought of is that if you're putting more people without shelter out on the streets, we're going to have more people uh, at the memorial for the people who have died as being homeless. Is that your intent, just to try to kill more people? I don't think so, but that will be the effect of doing something like this. As well as, it's probably, you know, you're going to take somebody like me who's getting back on my feet and, and confiscate his own only source of shelter and put him in jail. For doing what? Thank you. Thanks, Dan. All right, number three. Caller number 518, I just un asked you to unmute. Please state your name and record, your name and address for the record. Somebody needs to mute. Their, their, their phone is going off. All right. Caller number 518. I just asked you to unmute. Can you? Okay. Can uh, you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Can you please state your name and address for the record? And then you'll have three minutes to speak. <laughs> Yes, my name is John Flower. I live at 719 Pendleton Avenue. That's out on the east side of Longmont near 9th and Pace. I am the president of the Ryder Ridge Homeowners Association. The reason I'm calling is I understand you're discussing some changes to the rules about RVs and motorhomes parked on the streets. 
And what I wonder if you're considering is there are several residents in our neighborhood. I am one of them. And we have a small motor home that fits in the driveway. And sometimes I put it on the street and sometimes I put it on, on in my driveway. Um, when we're preparing for a trip, we have to put it on the street so it's level enough that the refrigerator works. Um, I just wonder if you're even considering this kind of thing, because the problem that I think you're trying to solve is people living in the RVs. I don't live in my RV. I live in my house. I live in the RV when I'm traveling places. And so I just want to make sure you're considering that kind of thing so that if if I want to put my RV out in the street for a few days to get it ready for a trip and make a refrigerator working, don't make that illegal. And, <laughs> you know, the last rule that you had, somebody could make a complaint if it was parked on the street. And I checked with the city attorney. He said, well, even though the ticket says they can confiscate it and they can, uh, I have to move it 600 feet, the city attorney said, yeah, if you put it back in your driveway, then you're in compliance. So... My answer to that rule is don't bother because I'll just put it back in my driveway. But uh, just remember to think about people who have, uh, I mean, our HOA, the rules in the HOA is that uh, if you have a vehicle in your driveway, it has got to be currently licensed. It just can't be an old junk vehicle. It's got to be in the driveway. And so our HOA doesn't have a problem with it. The other thing that came up when I was talking to my wife about this is that I think some people, when they get tested for COVID uh, and have to isolate from their families, um, you know what they what they can do is sleep in their RV if they've got one. Um, you know the, the the camp place over by the by the Humane Society that's closed. Uh, the city has some land where they could allocate for that or make it okay if you got a permit or something like that to sleep in your RV for a week or two on the street if it was because of COVID isolation. So that's something to think about. But the main thing I want you to consider is that people like me that have an RV and it's a good looking, fairly new one. I don't live in it. I just want to be able to put it on the street once in a while so that I can set it up for a trip. So. That's all I have. I hope you're thinking of that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. There should be one more, right? About it. Yes. Give me one moment. Caller number 811. I just asked you to unmute. Can you please state your Hello. name? Can you please state your name and address for the record? And then you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay. Uh, Deb McClintock. Uh, I live on 17th Avenue in Longmont. Um, I wanted to um, speak to um, Mayor Bagley and the council tonight. I had been on the first round of, of comments when you had discussed this before. So I'm back again. I'm hoping that the city council will continue to come up with a solution for the RV dwellers. I have lived in Longmont for 26 years, worked in the school district for 25. Currently, I found that I am having to find um, a new apartment. And I have been living um, off from 17th for about five years now. And unfortunately, my roommate is leaving and I have to find a new place. So I have been looking for a new place and have found that I am very much outpriced to live here in the city. Uh, for a 500 square foot um, suite, you would need to make $46,044 a year. For a one bedroom, um, $48,708 a year. And for a two bedroom, $52,524 a year. I cannot find a place to live. I do not make that much money. So my point is behind this is I feel like I'm being driven out of the city of Longmont after living here for 26 years. And so my point is look at the, the RV dwellers, what are they supposed to do? Uh, there was a lady who had posted on WhatsApp Longmont about her situation. She'd been waiting to get 
her voucher for money or something. They called her. She went the next day, and they had given her voucher away. I don't know what the ins and outs of that was. But the thing was, was that she, it was her and her children that were having to live in an RV. It's not just single people or, you know, people that maybe are more undesirable than others or whatever. And my concern was that she was feeling very upset that she can't find a place to live. And again, I, I do ask that you would consider the situation of COVID affecting the economy here and job availability here. And I just believe now is not the time to be banning the RVs that are on the street, especially with us going into winter. And I just, I just don't understand where um, the city, as expensive as it's getting, where uh, the RV people are supposed to come. And I'm frustrated because I can't find a, a place to live here in the city of Longmont. And I've been here for 26 years. And it's very concerning to me how there's very few available apartments in town. You can find any, and they're very expensive. And I just have that you would um, come up with a plan or continue to search for a plan on what can be done for the RV dwellers besides just moving them out of the city. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's it for public invited to be heard. Um, let's move. Oh. Harold, let's move on to your reports. Can we do COVID-19 first and then yep. do your city manager yep. report? Thank you. Yep. So Mayor Council, um, can you see the screen with the graph on it? Yes. Okay. So I'm um, trying to give you a, an overview of the numbers. Wanted to let you know, um, had some conversations with Boulder County Public Health next week. Um, we are gonna have a representative here, um, they are moving through some restructuring right now, just people working on data. Um, and um, so next week we'll have Rachel Arndt, um, who's working on a lot of the data, join us. Um, and she's working directly with Jeff and Susan Motico on this. So you also know um, we are now having um, meetings in terms of the administrator group again, um, it's three days a week primarily focused on the situation that's developing or the, the situation that occurred in Boulder and the actions they're taking. So that's where we're spending most of our time. Um, but it did let us bring up some uh, discussions regarding data and that's sort of where you're seeing a move. So today I'll be presenting the information. Um, I did get an update from them this afternoon. I haven't had a chance to really dive into it. So I'm gonna go with what's on the website. Um, and then as we get, as I can look at that information, Marika or myself will send that to you. But generally what we're seeing, the good news is as you can see the peak of um, over 200 cases. Um, and then where we are today, you can definitely see that the orders that they've put in place um, and the actions they've taken has started is, is, is having a, uh, an impact in terms of our numbers. Um, um, and you can see that downward trend when you look at the breakdown per, uh, when you look at the breakdown, um, when you have the number of students that have been included in this, um, you can see recently that um, on September 29th, we, we had um, 37 cases not associated with the university in 16. Um, and you can see that downward trend. And so the numbers at the university are getting smaller. But at the same time, you're also seeing the numbers within the community decrease a little decrease as well. What that really does is when you get into the testing piece and you start looking at what the overall percentage on the PCR testing looks like, um, the overall rate is 4.1, but the current five day average on the percentage is 2.6%, uh, which is much different than what we talked about at the last city council meeting. Um, again, you can see um, when we have the five-day rolling average, you can see where it's really just been dropping um, significantly over the last few days. And I think a lot of people, when we go over this and when I talk about it with staff, they go, well, are you doing fewer tests? Well, even when you see what occurred recently in October and you can see the number of positives, 
what you can really see is they're still exceeding a thousand tests per day. And so this is not a, I mean, you know, they are, they've been performing a large number of tests. I mean, you can see when that number got higher, but you can also now see where it's going down in terms of the percent positive. So that's really good news. Um, and as we've had conversations with the county, I think we're all um, excited to see this trend and we really need to continue um, to see this trend. Um, you will probably get notes from Marika and Rigo regarding the governor's press conference, but one of the things that the governor said today is that really the next couple of weeks are gonna be important for us as we head into um, late fall and winter um, and, and can really give a, an indication of what that's gonna look like um, for the entire state and all of our communities. And we still need to be diligent in terms of wearing masks, social distancing and um, good hygiene. You will probably hear me say that three to four times tonight um, because that's just really uh, important for us. This is another graph. If you remember when we showed this to you all last week, I think it will, you could start to see the downward trend and we were hoping that we could to continue to see that in this. It's really where you're seeing it 17 to 23, 18 to 22 and 18 to 24. Um, that, that has been where we've seen the bulk of the cases. You can see the increase that where we were seeing in some of the other population groups, specifically 25 to 34, you can really see that pick up, but you're also seeing it go down a little bit, 35 to 44 is in this range, but this is the, the positive sign that we were all looking for. Um, and I know that the county is continuing to work with them, CDPHE in the state in terms of the mitigation plans. And I know there's more conversations to come in terms of how they move forward. Um, once again, when you, um, you see the age range, again, really just dominated by this category. The 10 to 19 number is interesting because it's really the 18 and 19 year olds that are increasing uh, that have, um, the bulk of the cases in this, as you can see from the previous slide. Um, again, the five-day average of number of new cases is really sh mimicking what we were seeing in the PCR testing. So that, again, just reinfor reinforces what we see. And, and then again, this is what it looks like by community. Um, 2,700 cases in Boulder, 960 in Longmont. Then you can see Louisville and Lafayette. It's also important to look at this chart when they normalize it on 100,000 population, um, where you can see you know, we're, we're at a thousand, but you can now see Lafayette and Louisville when they normalize it on this hundred thousand, they're at 953 and 901 respectively. Um, um, race and ethnicity. Um, if you remember, this has historically been above 30% and now it's, it, it's shifted downward to 28.8. So that also gives you a sense of where we're seeing um, the cases being generated um, within our county. And then Long-term care facilities, again, you're not seeing a lot here, um, but what is interesting, and, and I, I can't zoom in for you all right now, but you can see that kind of show up in these two dates, um, and then it's sporadic as we saw this increase. Um, so again, I know the state's continuing and the Boulder County Health Department's continuing to really be diligent in terms of how they work with long-term care facilities, and then our hospital status, uh, again, is pretty consistent with where we've always been. Um, I've had the ability to look at some other data and look at hospitals and, and um, they all tend to be in, in really good shape right now in terms of those that are hospitalized um, related to um, COVID issues. I, uh, Dan was not on our call today, so I didn't get a chance to see what we have in our hospital system today. But if you remember, we had two last week. Um, so if, if that changes dramatically, we will definitely let you know. Um, and then finally, what I wanted to do is go over the um, statewide dial, because I think that's where you're now also seeing this start to come into play. Um, so when you look at Boulder County, if you will remember um, this, the 11 days of declining or stable hospitalization, that's really always been here. In the green, um, the two-week average positivity rate, um, I think last time we talked was somewhere in this area, it has now moved back into green. But perhaps the, um, the biggest change is, if you remember the cumulative incidents, we were somewhere in the red right about here and, and we're now moving back into the orange. And so earlier in the day, I think it was 
somewhere in this area. So all of that is really saying that we're moving in the right direction based on what we've seen. Um, that being said, I think the key message that I'm getting from my conversations with the um, Boulder County Health and in our administrative call and, and really echoing what the governor talked about today was um, just diligence in terms of what we're doing. You know, as a county, we've been really good um, in terms of, in, you know, prior to our recent case increase, Boulder County was always performing better than a lot of counties in the state. And um, so we just need to continue to be diligent. Um, wear, wear a mask. And um, so there it is again, wear a mask and socially distance. Um, I find myself saying that a lot. Be anyway, wash your hands and good hygiene. Thanks, Polly. Because um, I found myself saying that a lot because now we've had kids start to go back to school. Um, and what I've told uh, my two teenagers who are in high school is that you're also responsible for other people in this and make sure that you're following the rules and wearing your mask and not taking them off when you're passing in classes uh, because it really is incumbent upon us. And if we weren't learned one lesson from what happened in CU and the case counts is that if you don't do that, that can make a difference in the numbers. And again, managing our numbers and, and doing these things is really about protecting our local businesses and protecting the people that work in our local businesses because we know that's how they're gonna make the decisions in terms of what level we're in. And so we just need to continue to do that. The other thing, <clears throat> Then I wanted to update you on, on related to COVID is there's been a lot of questions regarding Halloween. So what I would do is point everyone to the Colorado Department of Public Health website um, and, and go to the Halloween page because they have a lot of information on Halloween and what people need to do. And um, you know what they really talk about in this, they, they lay out a lot, but um, the one thing that I wanted to point out is they do focus on Halloween mask, because that doesn't have necessary the same protection that a, a mask that we're wearing. And so they really encourage you that if you're wearing a Halloween mask, you need to wear another mask underneath it because the Halloween masks aren't designed for what they need to do. They also give a lot of tips in terms of how to, if you are going to um, provide candy, how to do that safely, because just the number of people you impact and, and the fact that it is within that six foot distance. And so there's a um, really a lot of good information on this. They also talk about, and I think, you know, this was really important, is that when, when you do go out um, with groups, um, you know, try to stay with your family, try not to have groups where you have multiple family units interacting with each other, because those are all opportunities um, for exposure. Um, a lot of information here, way too much for me to go over at this time, but I wanted to point out that that is available on the Colorado Department of Public Health website. Um, and I would encourage everyone to look at it. Are there any questions for me? Uh, let's go with Councilmember Christensen, Councilmember Hidalgo Faring, and Councilmember Waters. Harold, thank you for the information about Halloween. I love Halloween, but I don't, I'll have to go to that site because I don't really see a way to be able to safely hand out Halloween candy. But if there's a way, I'll do it. Um, I, I recently uh, read about the fact that, and I would just like us all to keep this in mind, all of us are fortunate enough to not have to be working in the service industry, although Councilman Hidalgo Faring has to deal with people every single day. So you could say that arguably that is that. And the, the statistic that I found really startling was that um, for middle class and uh, upper middle class jobs, about 60 of those, 60 percent of those have either come back or they've been resolved so that people can work at home. But for um, service industries and a lot of the other industries at the lower end of the pay scale, only 30 percent of those have come back. So I would, and when I look at the um, statistics on um, the people who are dying. Uh, and being hospitalized. It's very alarming that I have seen the Latino population go up and up and up. You know, the, the non-Hispanic white population is dying at about the same rate that they exist in the population. But the Latino population is going up by 3% more than 
their presence in the general population. And that is also true for the black population, which has gone up by almost twice uh, their presence in the population. So these are typically um, people who are working at the, in the service industries. And I would ask us all to be really cognizant of the fact that there are many different worlds here. And uh, if you're lucky enough to live in the one that's not as affected, that's nice. But the rest of the people are not getting very, not getting the same kind of medical care that they ought to get. They're dying at higher rates and we need to be protective of, of them and cognizant of, the, of what's really going on for everybody in this country. So uh, let's all take extra care when we're out there. Don't cough on your grocery guy, <laughs> et cetera, you know. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I think let's go ahead and make comments. Let's go ahead. Go ahead, oh, well, council member. I actually had a couple of questions, but Harold, did you want to add to what? Um, no, so, uh, I'm the mayor. Go ahead. Ted, say okay. a comment. Sorry. <laughs> I thought he was in the middle of saying something. He, well, he so, was, but let's continue. Okay. So one of the questions I had the other week, we saw a slide that had the community. It was disaggregated among the community spread, individual person to person spread and travel. I did not see a slide on that on the website. Um, I was wondering if there, do we have data on those pieces? And I've been getting a lot of questions on the difference between community spread and individual um, person to person. And so really I wanted to kind of make public what the difference is between the two. Yeah, so um, that slide is not on their website now, um, and so I'll have to follow up and see what happened with that, uh -huh. um, because we that was that has been on there for some time. Yes. Generally speaking, the difference is is that community spread is where you can't identify whether or not you are connected to someone who has been who is COVID positive, mm -hmm. versus person to person is when they go through the social tra the the tracing component, they can connect you to someone who is COVID positive. Okay. And, and so if you remember last week, most of those were person to person. Yes. Um, and that's exactly what they were doing when they were looking at the Boulder numbers and why they were able to say, mm -hmm. not in the classroom, but here's where it was occurring because they could identify that via the tracing. Okay. Okay. And then the other one is, so in conversations that I've had with Boulder County and with you and the district, is, you know, we were really looking at the airborne transmission. So the purpose of having the mask to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I read an article in the Washington Post that CDC is now saying that airborne transmission plays a role. You know, they've updated their website. I feel like a lot of the conversations that we've had at the city level, the county level, and the district have all been planning with the idea that it is airborne, that you do have these... Um, you know, the particles that are, are airborne. So, so that's the purpose of wearing the mask to begin with. Yeah, so when you get into the scientific definition of airborne versus the, the spread of droplets, yes. uh, the, the purpose of the mask is actually to restrict the droplets. So when we all talk, we're uh -huh. pushing stuff out. Okay. And so that's the purpose of the mask. Um, when you talk about airborne, if you remember when they were when we talked earlier about people exercising, yes, um, and when and where to, to wear it. So when you exercise and you're breathing harder, you tend to aerosolize whatever it is that's that's in your system, uh -huh. um, and then it hangs there longer. So I haven't read that article, um, but I'll try to read it to see what exactly are they meaning. Yeah, because um, it really gets into the nuances and the details, but. Um, whether it's aerosolized. And so when you saw what happened in New York, a lot of times they were performing procedures that aerosolized it versus it still being in droplet form. Okay. And that's why you saw more medical professionals get ill. Okay. I'm going to... And, and, and they've adjusted their protocols. So as we did early in terms of what we do and where we do it in terms of our paramedics um, was based on some of that. And, and so that's when we then look at our data um, again, the number of people that we've had test positive within our organization is lower. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, I mean, I think now we're probably above 10, but below 15, unless it's changed recently. 
-hmm. And that's really including those folks that provide that service. And so it is about the precautions and the protective uh, equipment that you wear when you're doing those things. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's just, again, another thing to think about as we're moving, right. as we're in hybrid now. <laughs> Right. Okay. Thanks. And, 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 and hey, and Susie, I wasn't snapping at you saying, I'm the mayor. I'm just trying to push us along. That's it. No, you're fine. All right. Dr. <laughs> I Waters. Take it that way. All right, Dr. Waters. I, the, the questions about <clears throat> masking kind of lead to my question. Uh, <clears throat> LPM has produced four uh, video public service announcements. Uh, having viewed them, I, personally, I think they're really well done. Uh, I'm just curious, what are, what are we, what's the city doing with those PSAs and, and how are we working with the business community or others to amplify both the message and the visibility of and access uh, or profile of the, of the video of the PSAs themselves? Um, Sandy, are you on? Sandy's really and Marika are working on the public information piece. Sandy or Marika, are you on right now to talk about where we are with those PSAs. Hey, Hi, Harold. <clears throat> Sandy, Hi. your assistant city manager. Um, we are planning to run those. Those were those are so great, and we appreciate the partnership with the businesses and everybody pulling those together. So we're going to run them um, sort of in a time phased manner out in social media and some other areas, um, along with all of our partners who will be doing the same. Yeah, I. Oh, there has. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Oh, so I know there's been communication with the partners, but if council will remember, um, I think this was part of an update that I gave a few a month or so ago, was a conversation that we had with the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. And really those businesses saying, we need to be behind this because we need this to remain open. And, and so that really was something that was born out of that conversation where they were saying they needed to be pro, more proactive in terms of sending this message. Yeah, I, I just I want to reiterate, that was a conversation that started in June. Mm -hmm. We're now in October. Yeah, uh, It's taken us that long to get four. Uh, there, as Sandy said, I, they were really well done. And, and whatever we can do to amplify the message and increase the profile, um, I think is time well spent. Uh, and I hope if any of our business community or membership organizations are, are, are tuned into this meeting, uh, they'll work with their members to get them on their own social media websites, personal Facebook, personal uh, social media uh, platforms, and, um, and, and get the message out. Council Member Waters, that would be my recommendation, is that each of you have your own personal um, social media accounts. And of course, we'll be sharing those uh, in all of the city accounts as well. Thanks. All right, great. Harold, anything else regarding COVID-19? Uh, nothing regarding COVID. I do need to go over some agenda stuff. So go, go ahead. Let's talk about the agendas. All right, Mayor, Council. So as, as we talk about this and as we were looking at the agendas in the future, we have a, an agenda coming up that is really crowded. Uh, many of these items are items that you all um, have, via recent discussions, have directed staff to work on. Um, in addition to this, um, so what's also coming into play that's not on this list is um, you will see a call for um, an executive session um, for next Tuesday um, where we'll need to, um, Karen, Kathy, and Eugene and I need to talk to you all about the housing authority. Um, but then from a, and, and this one is time sensitive, on October 20th, we would really like to have a joint meeting with the Housing Authority Board and the City Council to talk about what we need to do operationally. Um, when you take that and then you look at what's on this agenda, um, we have discussion on and direction on accessory dwelling units. That was um, something the Council asked us to bring back. Longmont Waste Services Program Review, that is something that you all had wanted us to follow up on. Um, the Land Development Codes code amendments associated with properties adjacent to city-owned property. Um, and then the inclusionary housing update, I need to pull that up. I think that one was made by, um, it was affordable housing that was requested um, and voted on on the 30th of July um, when staff was ready. 
Um, and then we have the AMI project review and discussion, which was um, which is connected to the budget discussions we've recently had. And so um, the challenge is if each one of those, you know, conservatively is 30 minutes and, and then we need the joint session, we can't get through all of this on the 20th. And so I wanted to talk to council about what you all would like to um, potentially delay on this list. And then I'll stop sharing the screen so the mayor can um, see hands raised. I don't know who went up first, but let's go the opposite way this time. So Dr. Waters, Councilmember Peck, Councilmember Christensen. For what it's worth, for my purposes, you can take B and D off of that list and schedule them at a different time. Um, the, for me, the AMI discussion, it, it, we're going to vote uh, the next Tuesday on a budget that includes $13 million for a smart metering system. Uh, I'd like to vote confidently on that evening, and I think the study session is critical to me being able to cast a vote with the kind of knowledge I need to be confident in my vote. Um, and I, I think the land code updates uh, and the ADUs, we've got we got a number of people in the community who are waiting to see what we're going to do with those and have keen interest in them. I think the other two, I'm not certain, I don't recall the, 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 the reason for the, uh, the review of the inclusionary zoning ordinance. I'm, I'll be happy to engage. I just think those things could come back, they're less time sensitive than the other three. Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Um, so ADUs, that is not including STRs, right? That's just ADUs. No, that, that's, that's short-term rentals is coming on the next meeting in general business. I believe it's the next meeting. Then I agree that uh, I would say you could take off ADUs and inclusionary housing. ADUs um, or the waste services? I can't see the screen. Oh, let me, let me bring it back up. Doc, doc, Dr. Waters had said B and D, referring to Longmont waste, uh, Longmont waste Services and changes to the inclusionary housing. Is that correct, Dr. Waters? Yeah, that was okay. correct. Those are okay. B and D were the two. Right. If it were just me, I'd take the B and D up. All right, can we, can we pop them back up? I would do A and B. All right, can we go ahead and... Oh. We'll go ahead and there we go. All right, uh, then Councilmember Christensen and Councilmember Martin. Yeah, I would agree with Councilman Waters and Councilman Peck that we could put off the waste services. And I think the, the affordable housing ordinance is going to be uh, a longer discussion. So I would like to put that off too. Be, and it's not as time sensitive as the other things, as Councilman Water said, they are uh, things we're going to be voting for coming up and people are waiting on our decisions. So we need to uh, put those, keep those in the forefront. All right, Councilman Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I have a question about the waste services. Is that report just on here because the staff's been working on it and it got ready or is there some sort of a uh, uh, a need to get special direction from the council about it. Um, so that is, I think, a combination of both. That is um, a report where you all wanted to, I think, before wanted to see where we are, talk about that, and then where do we go from here in the future, Dale? Dale? Dale, go ahead. You're muted, Dale. There you go. <laughs> Right. Uh, Councilmember Martin and Mayor Beck. Um, Dale, pulling, you're frozen. Dale, Dale's pulling a Cartman, pretending he's here. <laughs> Dale, if you kill your video, and your your audio should come in clear. Yeah. So I don't know. Did the council hear anything I just no, said? Or no. Was no. It all garbled. All Go again. Time. So, uh, uh, Council Member Martin and Mayor Bagley. The, the, uh, so, he's, he's still garbled. But, you know, hold, hold on, hold on. So basically, basically, was to give the council. Yeah, we lost him. It can be yeah. delayed. So, so, Harold, it can be delayed. 
It what he said, Dale said. It can yeah. be. Go ahead, Harold. Yeah, Dale said it could be delayed. I know there were people in the community that were anxious for this report, um, but in terms of, um, I wanted to hear from you all where you wanted to be and what you wanted to see in this. All right, so uh, who is the, Councilman Martin, you're next. Uh, that was my question. All right, so yeah, basically my understanding is the waste services presentation has to do with composting and recycling. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I imagine some of you have friends who follow council quite closely that might be a little upset that if we pull B, just my thoughts. Um, but the, uh, so Councilor Christensen. Well, as the person who brought composting forth in the first place, I think composting takes a while and, you know, we can, we can put that off for a few weeks, sure. especially in light of the fact that the city, the county is thinking about uh, starting a composting facility. So it might be beneficial to let that go a little further and find out what's going on with that. But it, it is a conversation we need to have, but uh, once again, that could be put off, I think a little bit longer so that we can have a f fruitful uh, meeting uh, at, that's not too jam packed full of stuff that we don't have time to discuss properly. I mean, I guess, so what I was going to say is that uh, the reason, and Councilman Peck, I didn't mean to be disrespectful or appear disrespectful to you at the beginning of the meeting when you were talking about the update on the, the, the lawsuit. Um, as I talked to Harold and staff, it's not just, this, this question isn't just about agendas. Um, in order to talk on a Tuesday night and get the information necessary to have a conversation, our staff has to do a lot of work for each of these issues. And so um, if it's a problem to fit it into a Tuesday night, it's especially hard to fit it into an eight to 10 hour or 12 hour work day. And so I know that our staff in many cases is working more than 12 hours a day. Um, they don't get overtime and they're, they're, they're doing a great job. And so we just need to be careful that as we continue, I mean, we've, we keep giving them these huge, huge tasks and they're all important but we have to just realize that they only have so much time in a day. And um, my personal opinion is that, I mean, the ADUs currently, the variances that we have downtown, there's no homeowners association. And, uh, and we get, I, the calls I get are not about, you know, the larger national climate changing events. People want to know, well, why is my certificate of occupancy being held up or, why is my neighbor building a ADU five feet off my fence line? Or why is there a pothole in front of my house? Or why in the world is my trash late? Or why aren't you cutting the weeds? Those are the kind of calls I get all day. And so, uh, and so the ADUs are, are, I think are pressing because we have a downtown district without a homeowners that are, are facing and people are applying for permits. And, and I, I personally don't want to change the characteristics of our the characteristic of our of our downtown neighborhoods. It's Old Town Longmont, I'd like to preserve it. Um, but, and then Herald city staff, they need our, they, 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 they're the ones who wanted to bring up the waste services, but it sounds like we're gonna go ahead and pull B if nobody cares. And then the other three um, were all items that council brought forward, um, but let's go ahead and if you guys don't mind, inclusionary housing is important, but what we're waiting on is an update as far, I mean, it's still going forward, but we could probably push off the update on how it's working. And so Harold, why don't we go ahead and keep one, three and five or A, C and, and uh, uh, E for that meeting? Anyone object to that? Okay, cool. And then, and then, I, and then I, I will need a, that the other spot, okay. and this is time sensitive, is the joint meeting on the that, housing authority. That's fine. We'll have an executive session on Tuesday. So we'll right, but then on the twentieth, a joint meeting. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. So everybody okay with an executive session on Tuesday? All right, cool. And let's do it at how much time are you going to need, Harold? Probably start at. I need an hour, but because we have to log on and get early, so I'd probably say start at 5.30. That way we can we try to get we'll you off. A little break. All right, yeah. that's fine. Okay, great. Okay, all right, thanks, Harold. Thank all you. Right, let's move on, Jim, to 
our 2021 budget presentation. And I promise I will not try to cut you off more than five times before you're done. Uh, Mayor Bagley, thanks. Uh, I don't think I'll be doing that much that you could get you five times, but we'll see. Um, so uh, I'm Jim Golden, Chief Financial Officer. Teresa Malloy is also with me tonight, the Budget Manager. All we're doing tonight is do some follow-up from some questions that Council raised last week. The first of those was a re request by Councilman Waters, and we had some confusion potentially over... Um, what was specifically being asked for. So what we did put into the council communication though, is uh, the programs within the uh, city budget for 2021, well, entire city budget, not just new dollars that were put into the budget. Uh, the, and each of those programs in the quartiles three and four for the priority based budgeting that uh, may have um, some, uh, influence in advancing the cause of equity or provide for folks that would not otherwise have been provided for. And we gave uh, you all an attachment in the communication of all of those uh, quartile three and four programs. I wanted to go real quickly. I have just a couple of slides here. I want to show you some more information. Uh, I think we might have um, overlooked something else that was being asked for. So if you get the next slide, please. Uh, this is showing uh, the 2021 proposed budget versus the 20 adopted budget for all funds uh, on the top there. That's the slide that we, we did show to you last week um, or the week before. Uh, below it, though, is a 2021 general fund ongoing requests uh, that were funded. Uh, and what we're, we've got there is they're, they're split out between a level one and level two so that you can see, um, well, this is actually totaling level one and level two. And it shows you how much from each quartile we did fund uh, in the 2021 budget. So those are new, new dollars in the budget. And then just breaking that out a little further in the next slide is we decided I wanted to separate this out so you could see the difference between level one requests and level two requests. And again, level one requests are, requ are uh, expenses that we're going to incur whether we fund them or not, they're contractual. A, a large uh, amount of these are from the Platte River Power Authority operating expenses uh, for uh, operating our, our utility billing CIS. Um, and those are falling in the third quartile there. Uh, so there are other items in here that, that we would incur whether we, uh, we cover these in the budget or not. Level two, we had a little bit more choice. We had a number of level two requests, uh, not a lot because we did, uh, we did tell our staff that they need to limit the amount of requests in the budget process this year because we knew we simply would not have unlimited resources or even even uh, a lot, most, much resources to deal with new requests. So um, on the, we did, we were able to fund some of those requests and those are showing here. So this is where there were more uh, choices being made though. Uh, so if that's it, you can remove that slide and any questions on that information in response to that request for information? No, let's move on. Next, we've got, I'm just kidding, Jim. That's one. That's <laughs> one. That's one. That's one. Okay, go ahead. All right, I will move on though. So the second item was about funding the, the Longmont Public Library. And what we've done is given you some information in your council communication on the amount of dollars in the uh, actually the 2020 budget as well as the 2021 budget for the library from uh, uh, multiple funding sources. Um, the general fund obviously is the largest source at $3.7 million in each of those years. The library services fund is about $69,000 in each year. Uh, those are from um, donations and grants. Uh, then we um, also have the public improvement fund and in the public improvement fund, we have a couple of uh, uses of the PIF for the library. As you know, part of the bond issue that we voted on a couple of years ago was to provide for a rehabilitation of the library building. 
It's uh, $2.12 million. And I believe that project, I know it was slated to begin in 2021. And I think that might still be the case. And then, uh, and that was, it's, that's actually been budgeted already. It was budgeted when we issued the bonds, but it's, it's within CIP to be used in 21. And then finally, we also have in the public improvement fund, uh, we are funding, uh, and I don't have the exact dollar amount because we're doing multiple facilities, but we'll be replacing flooring in the West Main entry to the library and the hallway and the meeting rooms. So that's also included in the public improvement fund. Uh, gave you information on a certain endowments that we've received in the past for the library. We use uh, the interest on those endowments are able to be utilized and the library board designate what the use of that amount of monies are. And you have that information in there. I'm not gonna take you through that detail. And the only other thing I want to point out is that we only did have, again, we, we asked them to, we asked the whole general fund uh, to limit their, their budget requests. There was only one budget request as a result from the library. It was an ongoing level two request for $50,000 of digital and print resources augmentation. We were not able to fund that on an ongoing basis. So the city manager did allocate $22,000 of one-time funding for that purpose for 2021. And then the only other thing I was gonna point out, I actually pointed out a little earlier in the meeting, which is what type of one-time resources you do have available uh, for you uh, for these needs or, or other one-time needs in this budget. So I gave you uh, actually the three sources being um, the property tax uh, and the marijuana tax and then the uh, stability reserve. So I wanna point out that the, the, the property tax and the and the marijuana uh, money from 2019 and 2021, I gave you a bunch of numbers on that earlier tonight. The total of those numbers is $512,000. So I would recommend obviously that you allocate those first before you consider going beyond that to the general fund stability reserve where we did allocate uh, $1.4 million toward that purpose. That's all I have. I can answer any questions uh, you might have. So thank you, Jim, for that update. But um, I do want to point out that the, the bond issue for the library was capital improvement project. It wasn't really operating uh, dollars or to buy uh, anything to improve the services that the library can give. So, um, and I do want to ask why we did not fund the full 50,000. That's really not that much money that the library asked for. Why don't we give them the full amount instead of the 22? Well, I will say for ongoing purposes, we uh, really did not have any more ongoing monies to allocate, but the city manager did consider uh, a lot of requests for, for one-time resources. And I think overall, he wanted to limit how much dollars we were using on one-time expenses in the 2021 budget. And so that's why he wasn't funding, uh, he only funded 22,000 for that purpose. But Harold, you might wanna to add to that. Yeah, so I think there were, there were, there were a couple of components in this one. Um, it was a, there were two components to the request and in talking to them in term, and Karen, I may have to have you help me jump in to remember, help me remember what the conversation was on that. But the 22,000 was really directly related to materials. Right. Um, and online resources, and then the remaining portion. Karen, what are you on? Do you remember what that was allocated for? So, hi, Karen's on. Um, yeah. So it it really um, so it really was to, and I think as Nancy presented to the um, to the, the mayor and council uh, about the preliminary results from the feasibility study. So it, it really was a, a combination of um, online and e-resources for children and for adults and to continue to um, build the adult um, collection. So those are really, and I don't, Harold, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact uh, breakout for that. So, so that was um, the 22,000. I can't remember what the remaining. Well, I think we did a combination. So okay. um, yeah, so I think what, what certainly has come to light during COVID was just 
the, the demand for the online resources from both children and adults. And, uh, and so there were, there was um, a request for both e-resources for both children and adults and increasing, I think, the adult collection. So, because regardless of the outcome of the feasibility study, those were demands that they certainly were experiencing, um, you know, the first part of the year. And, and I think that with um, what is being demanded of our students, be they uh, higher education or elementary, um, I, and I'm talking about FRCC as well, that uh, during this time, even if we have to put one-time funding, we don't know what next, what 2023 is going to look like or 2022, that even those issues will be brought up at those budget uh at those budget hearings is what I, or, or when we look at those different budgets for those years. So I, I would trust that it would be the library director knowing what requests come in that would actually know what they need. So if that's what they need, I, I suggest we fund it even if it's only one time. I'm always going to be a huge advocate for the library. <laughs> Give them what they need. So, um, I guess I'm going to make a motion then that we fund that that fifty thousand dollars that they requested, whether we take the difference out of one-time funding or not, and then revisit it if they bring it up again next year during the budget process. All right. Well, I'll okay. second that to, to advance the discussion because because I'd right. like to add to the thinking just a bit. All right, it's okay. been moved and seconded, Dr. Waters. Add to the thinking. <laughs> You're muted, Doc. Thank you. Uh, I know everybody's worked hard to try to stretch dollars as far as they can be stretched. And anything we do um, will be viewed likely by departments like, well, why, why, why didn't they do that for my department? But I do think the library has been perennially, perennially under-resourced. Mm -hmm. So anything we could do uh, in one-time funding, I think makes sense or is, is worthy. I would add to this, um, I, I, I wouldn't want to just limit it there because I, I have this question. I don't know what the dollar figure would be, but, but there was the, 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 the work that's been done on the feasibility study. I, none of us have seen the results. I, as the library lia board liaison, I haven't seen the results. We're going to see those results, I think, at our next uh, library board um, advisory meeting. Um, but I... I I, I guess it's a question, do we are, are we budgeted? I suspect we're not. Maybe we are just through our planning department to do the kind of planning that is necessary once we have a feasibility study to translate the feasibility study into a study planning documents that, that give us um, enough specificity to know what to do and, and over what kind of time frame and what it's gonna cost. There's a parallel question here, Harold, and that is, um, I think we did pretty good work, uh, a, a collective we, uh, both inside and outside the, the city um, staff, members of the community, on the STEAM work a year ago. We budgeted this year to do some follow-on. We, 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 that money didn't get spent. But I think we've got uh, the, the STEAM area falls right into the first and main project. And um, in both, of, both the feasibility study and the STEAM work, need to be translated, I think, into planning documents to make that work really useful. Is it, am I thinking about that right? Because if, yeah, if, no, if, yes. if the answer is yes, then my question is, how much more would we budget for the library, not just for the, to get to the 50, but beyond that, to, to flesh out from a planner's perspective, or using planning expertise, the planning documents necessary to actually make feasibility study useful. Uh, anybody so, else? Harold, do you want, I mean, go ahead and ask. No, that wasn't yes. a rhetorical question. That was, yeah. Harold, so, I mean, Her Harold yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so we, you know, so when we went into the COVID world, uh, some of the, the money for first in Maine, I'm going to answer a couple of questions in this. So some of the money for first in Maine and some of the money for the, the STEAM project we, we held because we said we may need that. And then as Jim has given you 
the updates um, in, in the chart that he indicated, those are, are monies that are now less likely to, to be needed. And so we will have those to be utilized. And I'm looking at Jim too, to utilize in that project. And then we, how much do we put in the, in the budget for those Jim this year or next year? For the first, the main transit station? Yeah. The, for, for this year, it was two and a half million. Correct. So it's two and a half million in the contract. And then for the steam, I want to say we had like a, we had a hundred and fifty was the number. Yeah. Yeah. We had 150 that we can use for next year to do the work in terms of what the dollar amount would be. I would need to get with um, Nancy and Karen to understand what would we need to then move into the next step of, of where we go from here in terms of the library. Now, from a facilities perspective, in terms of what do we need to do with the existing facility, that is the money that Jim's talking about in terms of what's going on with the building, because, um, you know, what we can do to the building and how we understand that can also impact operations in terms of how can we be, the, uh, the structure become more efficient and effective and provide the services that we do at a different level. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I'd be guessing right now in terms of what it would take, but that's a question that we can ask Karen and Nancy, and we can have that available on the 13th when we ask for final direction. It just seems to me that the work, uh, the follow-on to the feasibility study and the planning to translate the work that was done on STEAM into something that's actionable uh, in which somebody could make decisions, us or somebody else, about right. investment opportunities and land ag aggregation, that kind of thing. There's work that has to be done. It, it likely could be one-time money for the work on both projects. That's, that's what, the way that seems to me. And, and I'd like to know what that would require on the part of the library that we could add to Council Member Peck's motion uh, to both do the digital materials or whatever that's going to buy and finish, uh, put us in a position to take advantage of the feasibility study with putting together a set of plans. The other thing in terms of digital materials that I think came into play, I'm trying to remember back a few months, um, they also, we also got the a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts that was a joint grant between the library and the museum. And so there was a large digital divide component in, in that grant funding that's in play. And then also on the digital divide access and library programs that you all are talking about, we also did put the 110,000 via the CARES funding into that arena uh, as well. I needed to cover those two pieces. Karen, do you have an idea of what it would take for the next phase? Uh, Mayor and Council, and, and Harold was correct. So Teresa reminded me that the other 15,000 of that uh, 50,000 request was for the hotspots for the library and we were able to get um, hotspots funded through the National Endowment for Humanities grant. So thank you, Teresa, for reminding me of that. So, you know, I would say in terms of the feasibility study and, and uh, Council Member Waters, what you'll hear at the library board is that um, we, we will, what you're going to hear is what is, um, what are the needs? You know, what are the gaps? How does Longmont funding compared to peer libraries, um, you know, around the nation in terms of size of facilities, in terms of size of budget, those kinds of things. So that is all going to be presented to the, the library board and certainly we'll bring that back to city council. So what will not be completed yet is, is the next step is, um, so how might we fund that? So we should have a, a figure around What's you know what is a what is a gap and some of that's going to be about facility, um, and and so the work that is yet to be completed and some of that is really linked to COVID, to unstable finances right now. I mean, uh, you know across the across the nation, um, so we'll we'll probably have a better idea of a of a gap, but we will not have the work completed yet about. What are the various ways that we might be able to address that, the various sources of, of funding? Can I make one more comment, Mayor? Yep. So, Karen, I get it. The un, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just would not want to get into 2021. And, and when we raise the question about, so now what? We have the result of the feasibility study, or 
G, we did pretty good work on the steam area. And I, I wouldn't want a, the response to be, well, we didn't budget for that. So those things have to be sidelined until 2022 to return to the discussions. If it seems to me that we've got some one-time money, we ought to earmark whatever we think the, the amount would be to do what needs to be done to translate, to, to set the feasibility study, put it in a place where it can be actionable and do the planning translate the work on STEAM into a set of planning documents. So whatever those numbers are, Harold, seems yeah. to me that should be an earmark of the 512,000 in addition to the, uh, whatever, 38,000, would that be the number? Um, yeah, um, that, uh, or yeah, 28,000 uh, that Council Member Peck is, is proposing. Yeah, and so I, I do need to go back and answer that question. So of the 50,000 requests, 22 that we funded with one time, the, the remaining 18,000 was actually covered via the grant in terms of what they requested. And so that, I, I just couldn't, that was a pretty deep dive into the numbers and I just couldn't remember exactly why. You know, that if I look be, at- That if, would be $10,000 then to get it up to the 50. Yeah, Harold, what, maybe. What, wasn't it the 15,000 that was funded through the grant? Some, yeah, it was, it was a hot spot. It was so you try, you're trying to go from 22 to 35 then, right? Yeah, no, so that was the 35 because we were going to fund the 35, but then the grant covered that. And so whatever that remaining piece is, we can look at it. And then in terms of putting a marker in, I mean, just as I look at it, so we put 150,000 in for first in Maine, which is a much broader area um, and a lot more work. My gut would tell me between 50 and 75 for the next phase. Um, but what we will do is we will work with Nancy and Karen to have a number for the next council meeting for you all to consider. All right, John, do you want to repeat your motion? Yes, but I just want to clarify. So we're talking about just 15,000 to bring them up to the 50 that they asked for. Is that correct? Okay, so I'm going to amend the motion that we uh, direct staff to find the $15,000 in their budget somewhere to bring uh to bring the request from the library up to the 50 grand that they that they requested. I'll second the amended motion. Uh, I think it's I think it's a great 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 amended motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Councilmember Peck. All right. Can, can I ask um, for clarification now? So sure. <laughs> Did I not just hear to tell us to go find it somewhere else in the budget? Meaning, or did I? Ba basically, what, 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 we, what, what you were to take that as is we're going to go ahead and asking that you please take 15000 from somewhere. One right. time. So one time. Could, be council, could, be, could be one time, council okay. contingent. You just come back and let us know what's easiest for yeah. you. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so, Jim? We're done. I, you're done. Wow. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. All right. Let's move on then to follow up and discussion about RVs. Harold, you around still? Or Karen, you're going to take this one. I don't think this is yours. Or is it yours? No, this, this is Karen. All right, go ahead. Great. Uh, Mayor and uh, City Council. So there are um, a, a couple of items associated with our conversation that we had back in August about RVs and the increasing number of individuals who are using RVs for, um, for their living and the conditions of those RVs and the impact on the, um, on the neighborhood. So, so I'm gonna start with the, um, the, the first couple of items that council asked us to come back and have a, a discussion. And, and that had to do with, um, basically the, well, there are three, three directions that we got from council. One was to consider an RV ordinance that would uh, prohibit RVs or sleeping sleeper vehicles from um, being parked on public property, including um, parks and, and trailheads. And then there was a, a, a direction that says, okay, so if we do pass such an ordinance, 
we want to look at some options for providing assistance or helping folks who are using those sleeper vehicles for their housing temporarily because of circumstances and what might we do for those individuals before um, who are impacted by an ordinance should council pass it. And the third direction that we received had to do with um, an inquiry about the county owned land along Alaska Avenue. And could we uh, have a conversation with uh, Boulder County officials around potential uses for that property that the county owns in, in Longmont for potentially for um, an RV lot again, for folks who are living in their RVs due to, um, due to circumstances and not by choice. So, so after this conversation, uh, Shannon Stadler from Code Enforcement and Jeff uh, Satter from Lama Police will be talking about the RV ordinance. And uh, we thought that it might be helpful to have a conversation about the other two items before you have the conversation about the, um, the RV ordinance. So, so I will, um, I will, I will hit it fast, Mayor. And uh, so I appreciate uh, it, but but could we start maybe with the last one first? That might be easiest. You don't have to. Never mind. Just do what you're gonna do, Karen. The last one first, meaning the ordinance. No, no. The, the you gave a list of things. Yeah. Well, I'll okay, I'll go um, ahead. Just, just do it. Well, I'll do, start. Do it I'll way. start with one. I'll start with the um, the request to have a conversation with Boulder County about using the um the property at, at 1288 alaska avenue as a as a as a rv safe lot so um we included and in, in your your council packet and i believe the city manager also forwarded a, a letter from jana peterson who's the administrator for boulder county and basically indicated that that land is is in use so uh, there are three departments in the county. So it's the Sheriff's Department, Public Works, as well as uh, the Boulder County Housing Authority that are using that, that property. It has an active use and it is not available for any kind of uh, community use, um, including parking um, RVs in, in that lot. So that's, that's the answer to that question. Uh, so I guess, Mayor, that's the, that's the easy one, right? Or at least that's where we have a, a clear direction from um, from county officials, we did not pursue any further conversation with them um, at that at that point in time about that particular uh, property. So the second thing that we did some follow up on, um, you know, really had to do with the um, what else might we be able to do? Or how might we be able to assist folks who are living in their RVs by circumstances? To, um, to basically help them in the event that council would provide, would pass an, an ordinance banning recreational vehicles or sleeper vehicles from public property. So there were uh, a couple of things. And um, so Eliberto Mendoza, who also works in community services is, is on the line. He did some research as far as what is available as far as RV par parking in uh, close proximity to, uh, to the city of Longmont. That inf information is in your council packet. So he researched uh, the country wood in that is uh, that's here in Longmont, as well as the mobile home, um, the an RV park that's along Highway 52, as well as the, the Johnson RV uh, park, which is in Johnstown, which is further away from here. So, um, so in essence, you'll see that information in your packet, but there wasn't a lot of. Um, room in a lot of space available in uh, those three areas for, um, you know, for basically uh, parking RVs in there. There's a, a wait list and it, um, they're in pretty high, high demand. The other thing that we did talk about initially was um, a, a conversation with the Boulder County about the use of the fairgrounds and the RV uh, camping and parking that's there. And and, and what we certainly discovered in that initial conversation, and I believe Joni Marsh had the, had the conversation with county staff around that, is that the RV, RV campground is closed right now. Um, and the, uh, so the only thing that's really functional in the, RV, in the campgrounds, the fairgrounds, is that, um, is that RVs can access the dumping station for disposing of um, 
of basically wastewater. And so that is that is is operational. And if we were interested in providing um, any kind of uh, vouchers or assistance for RVs to be able to uh, dump their their wastewater in the dumping station, that would be um, that is certainly something we can can pursue. The um, there was a follow up discussion. I believe Harold uh, had a, a follow up discussion um, with uh, you know with Janet Peterson about you know is there any could there be any possibility that on a, a short term temporary basis three months maybe up to six months could the fairgrounds RV be be a possibility for some temporary location of again folks that are living in their RV by circumstance not by choice that we might be able to work out something and provide some assistance and really helping to get folks linked into services or some kind of housing options. Um, given that we might be, that council might be passing a, an, an ordinance that prohibits RV parking on public property. So it, it appears that, um, that that window is not totally closed, that there can, um, there, I think the county is open to having some conversation about that. The recommendation from, from the county administrator is that, um, that she would want that particular option to be vetted by the um, folks that are involved in Homeless Solutions for Boulder County so that any um, recommendation that, we, um, that the county might come up with would be informed by what is happening with, um, with Homeless Solutions for Boulder County as far as folks uh, coming into and being uh, assessed through the coordinated entry system that they would truly be engaged in those services with the intent of moving toward permanent stable housing. So, so, so anyhow, that was uh, that that window was open, and and I would say that if council wanted us to pursue that conversation with uh, Boulder County and Homeless Solutions for Boulder County, that it seems like that 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 could indeed uh, that could indeed be possible. The other caveat that the county administrator uh, reminded us is that the the Boulder County Fairgrounds is uh, when if they're uh, in 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 case of a fire disaster, which again there are a lot of fires happening um, throughout the area, is that that's the location for um, evacuating animals. So that if indeed there were some um, evacuation orders in Boulder County, uh, that the fairground campground would be um, off limits for any other use other than for evacuation purposes and for evacuating animals in case of a wildfire. So, so that is the uh, the quick overview and and. So Karen, I want to jump in. Yeah, I'm going to jump <laughs> in on a couple of. So one of the things um, that Jana and I also talked about. Um, and it's really about the B and B question in terms of the county regulations, um, and and so she did look and to see if it, anything had come through their system. Um, it actually hasn't, and and so we, we've got to figure out what's going on there because they're actually on the east side of County Line Road One, which I'm not sure if that's a Weld County issue that they're referring to. Uh, versus a Boulder County issue. So we, we've got to relook at that too, because um, it does look like they're in Weld County. If it's the right location that I'm looking at. So we've got to figure that one out. So I, th I think just to, to, uh, to wrap this up, and then obviously we are available for, uh, for the questions is that the, the recommendations that we put in the council communication is that if indeed the, the council chose to move forward with some kind of a um, RV ordinance that prohibited parking on public property, that it is possible to delay the um, effective date of that ordinance. And, and we would be suggesting that, um, that, that, that there would be a delay between when it passes and when it's effective to really give staff the opportunity to uh, do outreach, to work with folks in the community, in the situation um, that are living in their um, RVs and to do outreach and really to get them 
connected with coordinated entry and work to get folks into housing, to diversion, um, or certainly informing them about what the what the ordinance is going to be, and we need to be making they need to be making some other plans. Um, we certainly can move forward if council would like us to do that, to have the conversation about the fairgrounds as some um, a, a temporary option and what those circumstances would be. And, um, and that again, we would continue to work with our partners, with HOPE, um, both a shelter that does outreach in, in the community and, um, and, and to really work with folks to, um, to do that outreach to help get folks um, in a more stable situation than living in their um, in their in their RV. So, right. Councilmember Martin, and then Councilmember. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, Harold, uh, first of all, you uh, lost me there when you said uh, you know I was focused on the fairgrounds and and the um, and the mid reach property that we were asking about leasing from Boulder County, and then you switched over to the. B and B land east of I had no idea what you were talking about east of County Lane Road. So in uh, Eliberto, it's um under I'm trying I need to make sure I get the right page number. It's on page two of the council com where it says staff researched RV parks in and around Longmont. They mentioned B and B Mobile Home Park. Um, oh, it was and, the name of a park. Okay, it was the name of the park, and they were saying that they could. Um, do you get it said due to county regulations, it's hard for him to expand. So mm -hmm. I kind of broached that topic with Jana to go, is, is this you all? And she went in and looked and couldn't find anything in the system, which is then when you look at where it's set, it's on the northeast corner of the intersection of 52 and East County Line Road 1, which means that it's probably a Weld County issue. So that's a different conversation as to the county regs um, in this. And I just think there's more, you know, it's a different conversation that we have to go through on that issue. Okay. I would like to make a motion, um, but uh, can, should I, I should make the motion and we can discuss in the context. A motion um, is appropriate. Yeah, I'd like to move that the staff go ahead and pursue the option of, of providing a, a 90 day, uh, roughly 90 days until the 1st of January, rental arrangement with the Boulder County Fairgrounds. Um, that seems pretty safe um, because it's not fire season during that period of time. Uh, and then we could put out dumping vouchers um, as well for people who have RVs and we could do a, a achieve a, a, a pretty significant improvement in the public health situation by doing that. Um, okay. So that's my motion that we proceed with that, whatever else. I'm sorry, I jumped in too fast, but I second it. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have further, further discussion on this? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, I believe folks remember from the previous conversation that I was uh, worried that we'd go ahead and move forward with this, uh, this ordinance or, or prohibition uh, without fully exploring options uh, for folks. And that if we did pass an ordinance without exploring these options, that they would go by the wayside and we'd largely just think that problem solved and move on. Uh, and that was one thing I was worried about. And I still think that we're probably missing what is likely a small subsection of the population because for one, uh, Boulder County seems fairly inflexible with expanding the scope of HSBC and the coordinated entry program to accommodate people that aren't necessarily looking for traditional housing uh, or to, to deal with them in one way or another. I understand that uh, that is the you know prerogative of Boulder County and housing sir HSBC um, and seeing that we do have at least some temporary options and I will still as I supported last time the the motion as far as the th 
January 1st, I guess, delay, as opposed to, I believe it was a 90 day or three month. Uh, that was the motion previously at the last discussion. I'll still support that. And I, you know, I still would prefer that, and obviously it does not seem market, uh, market feasible as nobody does this, but finding some location which would not be free uh, maybe partially subsidized for those who are showing financial need, but another location, because as we've seen, all the locations that were provided in the, the staff report are generally full or have a waiting list, and there's not a lot of options for folks that aren't already in those, those spots. So that, that, that worries me somewhat, but I'll be supporting the motion, um, and I hope that we do continue further explorations and dialogue in finding places for people that aren't looking for necessarily traditional housing. Um, but with that, I'll be supporting this motion. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't see anybody else. So I guess I'm pretty, I'm, Councilor Martin, you can go ahead and have your say before I have my say. Thank you. Um, I just like to say that uh, I really emphatically confer with the mayor, con concur with the mayor pro tem. Um, I think it's pretty paternalistic of us or of HSBC to, um, to only provide services to people who want to be like everybody else. And it seems like we should find a way to accommodate that. At the same time, um, you know, the current arrangement just is not fair to people who do want to be like everybody else. And so we can't, we can't twist ourselves into a pretzel um, just to accommodate uh, what appears to be, according, according to code enforcement, a really small number of very responsible RV dwellers. Polly? Uh, I'm supporting uh, Councilwoman Martin's um, initiative. I think that's only one of the options we need to discuss tonight. I agree with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez that we need to we need to have a multi-pronged approach. We need to give people some time to adjust to this. So I'm all for the what was suggested in the packet that it not take effect until I think it was either I thought it was January 30th, but you know, we certainly can't have people in the middle of the winter with no place to live. So um, I would I want to discuss also the actual ordinance itself and the way it's phrased and the way we're approaching this whole issue, but we'll do that after we vote for this part of it. So thanks. All right. So I guess let, let, let me let me I'm trying to understand. So Councilman Martin, the motion is that uh, between now and the first of January, in order to prepare, assuming we pass the ordinance, the city would take action in order to make space at Boulder County Fairgrounds? Yeah, it was strictly to proceed with the uh, line of attack uh, that Director Roney uh, described, which is um, make some space during that interim period of time um, available by leasing it from Boulder County Fairgrounds and uh, obtain or create vouchers because I guess they didn't they didn't close the waste dumping facility which was really right. prudent of them um, but I think a lot of people have thought that it was closed because the park was closed right I, um, I, I get, on, I'm not asking you to, to, to give your reasoning I got I, I'm asking you to restate the motion so that so that's, yeah and so, that's so, so, the whole thing proceed with with what Ms. Roney said uh, in, in terms of finalizing that arrangement. So, so in order to not leave people flat-footed when the ordinance takes effect on January 1, is that? Your... Exactly. Okay, all right. Uh, Dr. Waters? Uh, just to clarify that motion specifically, because of what I've read in the council communication, uh, if we were to successfully negotiate a deal with the, an agreement with the county, those who would be eligible to use that, that facility would be those that would register with um, uh, our, our coordinated entry program and uh, be pursuing or seeking transitional or permanent housing. Is that correct? Yeah, if I can, if I can jump in on that. So a couple, I wanna make sure everybody understands a few points. Um, can, one, I, can I say one more thing, Harold? 
Okay. Come back to clarify, because I, I, I want to add this point. Um, for Because I've heard a couple of references of people who don't want to be like everybody else. And I don't, you know, nobody, there's nothing in this ordinance that signals that people who choose to live in RVs ought to be like everybody else. But from my perspective, if somebody's in an RV by choice, um, somebody should have asked a question, where am I going to park my RV before I chose to live in an RV? I don't feel like the city's obligated to create a facility for people who chose to live in an RV, not by choice or not by circumstance, but by choice. Um, we all make choices and we have to live with the consequences of our choices. Everybody who rents a place, buys a home, pays a mortgage, pays their lease, we all make those choices. If I make a choice to buy an RV, I'm going to ask somebody ahead of time, where can I park it? Because in because I don't think we ought to allow parking in parks, greenways, and on, on streets for people who are there by choice. And if we're going to put a dollar into creating a facility, for my purposes, any dollar we spend in this area ought to be to get people into transitional and permanent housing. So I, the explanation about the negotiation and the, and the fairgrounds will be appreciated. So again, it, it's a short duration, potentially three to six months. Um, really the potential for that transition or transition point as we move through this. Um, they do want it vetted through HSBC uh, for consider and recommendations. Um, and, and here, and, and so those, those, here's where it gets pretty solid, must engage to participate in a coordinated entry screening um, and to attain more permanent housing solutions. Um, they must stay engaged with the coordinated entry, because if you remember when we've talked to you, people will sign up and then they will disengage. And so they must be, uh, continue to be engaged in, in that process. Um, and, and, and then they may have additional requirements that come into play. And, and so we know that it's, it's work that we have to continue to do, but what was very clear to me um, in talking um, with Jana and I think what Karen's heard from her counterparts is um, we can't move away from coordinated entry as we're, as we're moving into this world. This is merely a short-term bridge. And I want to be very clear on that. And there's not a lot of spots as, as we look at this in terms of those conversations. Part of the other component with this that I, am, I would like Karen to talk a little bit about is the bridge housing component. Um, because we do, we are seeing more resources come to bear in terms of the potential for bridge housing. But I wanted to reiterate those points on the fairgrounds because I didn't want people to think that it was a longer period of time than, than what we're hearing. Just hold on one second. So Mike, just clarification. You said three to six months. The motion's for January 1. Two different issues. The, the so duration. Clarify, clarify the two issues then, please. So the, what I understand is one of the options on the ordinance was council could pass it and it would become effective on January 1. Mm -hmm. What the county's talking about is a three to six month period from when, when we start in terms of if they're willing to do this, it would be for a period of three to six months. In order, where three to six months is the max they're willing to let us use right. fairgrounds. If, if they're willing to go there. Understood. And I guess the uh, let, let's go ahead and go with Karen, and then and then uh, Marsha. So go ahead, Karen. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, so I think uh, when you get to the next item about the ordinance, I think that you certainly can talk then about the effective date. So, I, you know, we just put that in this communication is that you know, delay the effective date. So to give us some time to really work with individuals who are um, living in the community, living on public property in, in, in um, sleeper vehicles to try to try to work, to try to explore other options. And um, so I think, you know, the direction is that we will have that, we will, we will have that engagement with the Boulder County about the use of the fairgrounds. And, uh, and, and, we'll, and we'll do our best to see where that leads us. And I think the other comment that, um, that I wanna make is, I, I certainly understand what council members have talked about in terms of um, 
he was like the paternalistic uh, perspective of homeless solutions for Boulder County. And, 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 and I guess what I would just want to reiterate is that we explore with folks that we are working with all different kinds of housing exits. So um, our interest is really making sure that we have more stable and more sanitary options for, for folks to live. Um, and that could be a variety of um, a variety of options, um, but we're looking for legal options and and uh, and options that provide some stability to folks so that they can um, you know they can they can thrive. So, just wanted to point that out. Oh, hold on one second. Sorry. Um, the uh, just just something before I call on. Uh, we're going to actually go with Paul or Councilmember Christensen, then Councilmember Martin, just because you've already said a few comments on this matter and it's your motion, Marsha. Okay. I received two phone calls from upset citizens this week who both did not want us to pass the ordinance, um, wanting to know why in the world we would impede on their ability to, you know, live in RVs. Both bought their RVs this week, knowing the council was going to be talking about this issue. I found it very interesting. Um, Councilmember Christensen. You're muted, Polly. Sorry. Um, I would like to call the question. We've been discussing everything but what Councilwoman uh, Martin was talking about. I would like to move on so we can actually discuss the ordinance and a few other things. I have some motions that I would like to make too. All right, so, so hold on. Once, the, once the question has been called, uh, I think it needs a second. It's not debatable, and we need a, a majority vote. Does anybody care if we just vote? Second. No, but I'm just saying, does anyone care? Is, can we do it by consensus? Can we just go ahead and vote? Or does somebody really, really, really want to say something? Let's just go ahead and vote. All right, all in favor of Councilmember Martian's motion, which basically was uh, uh, instructing staff or directing staff to uh, negotiate with uh, Boulder County and, and the use of Boulder County Fairgrounds in order to uh, create a space for people to who own RVs and are sleeping and using RVs as their home in order to uh, 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 help them prepare for this ordinance when it is enacted or should it be enacted later on this evening. Um, say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. All right. It passes unanimously. Thank you, Council Member. All right, um, I'm actually, and then does somebody want to make a motion for the actual ordinance itself at this point? So we don't have Councilmember Christensen? We need to present on that. All right. Quickly. Let's go ahead and take a, do you mind if we make a two minute, take a two minute break real quick? Anyone, anyone mind? I've got something in my eye and I need to go wash it out. Anybody care? All right, cool, thanks. Back in two.
my counsel chambers is cold. So is mine. You know, can someone please turn off the heat? <laughs> Sandy, turn off the heat. Actually, my laptops heat the little corner that I that I sit in for these meetings um, to an that, almost unbearable level. If that's true, you need a new laptop. They're very new, except the city one. Ah, I don't use my city one. And Councilmember Christensen and Councilmember Peck, I mean, you don't need to raise your hand. We're not in session yet. We're still waiting on Mayor Pro Tem. I want to say something. I'm going to screenshot that, mo that what you just did, Polly. I'm going to screenshot. <laughs> all right. All right. Looks like we're all back. So let's go ahead and continue. Councilmember Christensen, let's go with you. And then Councilmember Peck, you'll go next. Uh, let Councilman Peck go first. Okay. Councilmember Peck, why don't you go first? Oh, how kind. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm glad you made that motion, Marcia, or Councilwoman Martin. Um, but if, in fact, the uh, the county says no, we cannot use the fairgrounds. We're back to square one. So, to Alberto and Karen, Alberto, I guess, and Karen, um, is there a regulation through the county that no more permits for RVs are going to be allowed? So therefore, or, or expanding of RV lots that are right there, that are there already. And the reason I'm answering, asking this question is that we, we don't have any place for people who want to live in their RVs to park if in fact there are no spaces in these lots. So, uh, Alberto, in your research, did you find that there is a policy with the county that they are not allowing any new RV parks or expansions of uh, existing ones? Uh, Councilor Peck, uh, Mayor Bagley, Council Members, um, I did not. I did not look into that. Um, back to Harold's point about that place in uh, what seems to be Well County. He, the owner, didn't indicate to me which county he was in. He was just saying he was having issues with a county, uh, and he has the land to expand, um, but he can't because of some county issues. But I didn't delve into which county he was in. And my understanding, and I think, um, was that it was actually the, the city of Longmont that did not allow more RV parks. I think uh, that came up during an, a conversation around Safe Lot, but I think Joni knows more about that as far as the code is concerned. Is that a, oh, so it would be the, the, the LDC, the Land Development Code, or is it just a, a spe specific regulation for RVs? Could you... There she is. Hi. Hi, Mayor Bagley, Councilmember Peck. So El Eliberto is correct. So the Land Development Code has not allowed new RV parks in the city, I want to say, since the early 90s. So mm -hmm. um, that is not an allowed land use. I have not checked Boulder County's land use code. I could certainly do that and check in with Dale Case there and see what their current regulations do or don't allow. Okay, so um, thank you, uh, Joni. Um, so I'm thinking that we don't want to go back to square one and have to revisit this. We should have some kind of a vision. I'm very concerned about climate migration, which other middle states are already seeing. And we, I want us to have a plan so that we're not caught off guard. Uh, if in fact, I am thinking, can we have a temporary moratorium on that land development code not allowing RV parks? So that, um, so that if the county does say no, they will not allow us to use the fairgrounds, then we can, we can direct the staff to look within the city for that temporary space. Um, so I, I am just gonna make a motion so that going forward, we don't, we have a plan. So um, I move that we direct staff if we cannot, find space for a safe lot within the county that we uh, temporarily have a moratorium on the LDC code, code pro, uh, prohibiting RV parks within the city. RV lots, I'm not even gonna call it a park. All right, so I guess I guess uh, my thoughts are, can we, Kelsberg Christensen? Second. 
All right, there's, mo there's a motion. I guess I was going to say it'd be nice to have a motion on the actual ordinance. It's, we we don't really have one. No, but but I guess what I'm saying is that right. So that's my point. So Councilmember Martin, um, uh, I won't vote to to reconsider your your original or, uh, ordinance or your original more motion. But I, I I was acting on the assumption that we were going to move forward with staff's recommendations to prohibit RV parking on our streets. Um, as much as I feel for people, these are people that don't pay property taxes. They could literally start their car and move to another town tomorrow. They could drive into our town yesterday. Um, and they are, they are, I mean, I understand that some people might have been in Longmont and some people choose or don't choose to live in them, but uh, our city streets were not made to accommodate our RVs. So until we actually, I'd like a motion. If not, I, I move that we direct staff to actually proceed with the ordinance of prohibiting um, RVs from utilizing city streets at all, um, as presented in our packet. Um, Were you addressing me, Mayor Bagley? No, no, I was just basically making a motion. I mean, I've, I've been asking for- Well, somebody. there's already a motion. No, no, I, I know, but you're right. You're true, that's out of order, then I'll do it after. But my point is that we need that. You know, I don't, I don't want to have a, I'm not going to vote for the motion that's currently on the table. I would if we had, if we address the original motion, but I don't want, if we don't address the, 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 the original intent of this agenda item, all we're doing is approving safe lots, if that makes sense. So, well, actually, uh, what, what I was, the way I thought we would proceed is, is to go ahead and recommend moving forward with the ordinance now. If we have a three month period and we can't come to a, an arrangement to cover that period, we can repeal the ordinance again. Right, but, um, but what I'm saying is there's no motion. We, the ordinance is not, has not been, we've not set, it, it directed staff. All we've done is said, you know, go ahead and make sure that through January 1, we are, we are talking with Boulder County to use the fairgrounds. That's my only point. So let's go ahead and start with Council Member Christensen this time and Council Member Peck. Actually, let's go with Karen, then we'll go with Polly, Joan, Susie. Okay, go. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And um, so I did, I think Harold talked a little bit about this, but I, I did want to follow up on the, um, the concept of, of bridge housing. And this may or may not address uh, Council Member Peck's uh, concern. So we are also pursuing at the same time that we're pursuing these other options, a, a couple of things. One is... Um, we are uh, partnering with Boulder County to write uh, and submit a grant for, um, really would be for funding for uh, temporary uh, bridge housing. Um, and that would be uh, basically uh, hoteling for, uh, for a temporary port, uh, par, par, part in time, point in time that really is related to COVID. So we are, um, that we are, are pursuing that and um, should that funding be granted, that, uh, my understanding is that funding would be available starting in November 1st. So again, that there's a lot of things that have to happen, but um, I do wanna let you know that we are, are pursuing that as a resource to help with this situation that we're talking about here. And also, um, yeah, I think we put this in the, in the council comm is that we also are looking at a couple of different options in terms of master leasing with the funding that we did receive from city council in 2020 to help with housing exits. And so, um, so part of that's been working with the Lamont Housing Authority. And, um, and so we're pursuing master leasing options that then also gives us some flexibility for some uh, temporary housing as we help people get into more uh, permanent stable situations. So we are working on a plan A, B, and C for how do we help people that are in really uh, unstable housed situations to move toward, um, toward more stable permanent housing. So I just wanted to let you know that. Okay, Council Member Christensen. As I said earlier, I have several uh, motions, one of which is a, um, prohibited use, which is, but uh, I can't give it until we vote on Councilwoman Peck's proposal. I believe what we're trying to do is 
uh, proceed along with what Councilwoman Martin said, with what Councilwoman or Council, I mean, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez's concerns were, uh, Councilwoman Hidalgo Faring and Councilwoman Peck and I trying to set the stage for not just uh, a discussion of the ordinance, but a discussion of the the, the um, effects of this ordinance and getting those in place before we discuss an outright ban on living in your vehicle, not banning RVs from the streets of Longmont, which punishes everyone in the city who has an RV or any kind of work vehicle, but simply living and sleeping in a vehicle on the streets of Longmont, which needs to be prohibited because it can't, we can't have people living on the streets in their vehicles and dumping their sewage and dumping their garbage and doing their laundry and doing, their, you know, we can't, we can't afford that. However, I, we need to vote on the um, issue that we have at hand right now. And then I will be happy to make a, a motion to prohibit the use of any uh, trailer coach, mobile home, self-proposed motor home, trailer or recreational vehicle, or any recreational equipment of any kind cannot be used for living, sleeping, or residing on any street or public right of way within the city. Council, but first we have to vote on Councilwoman Peck's motion. Yes, Councilor Beck. So Mayor Bagley, uh, I don't agree with your assessment that all, of, all uh, RVs should not be allowed on the streets because it's punitive. Well, that's not, that's not what I, first of all, let's stop the conversation. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is in the packet, I was generalizing. What I'm saying is there's a, there's a packet item that we have not yet voted on, and that, that's it. I'm not arguing that we ban all RVs. That's not the point. My point was, there's an item in our agenda that was suggested. That's what I was referring to. So, I mean, just to okay. cut everybody off, but keep going. Okay. Um, the point, to, and, I, and the discussion about the bridge loans, I think, is important because to uh, Mayor Pro Tim's point of view that people do want to live in their RVs and there is no place to park, they can't, they don't want or can't afford rent, then possibly we can bring in that bridge loan conversation to help them move off of our streets. I don't know if that's possible, but it is a discussion that we need to have. So um, if we are going to help residents who are affected by COVID for some reason or other have to live in an RV until they can find housing, I don't want to kick them out of our, our town and say too bad. That is the point that I wanted. That's the point of my motion is that we don't stop looking just because the county says no to us. Is there, can we have a temporary solution by just putting a, a halt on our LDC code? That was the point of that. Until we can get these people into housing first through the coordinated entry system. Um, it is compassionate, it is empathetic, it is what we should do for our residents. So I call the question. All right. Second. Okay, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of having the ceasing all debate at present, say aye. 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 Nay. Nay. All right, the ayes have it, six to one. Uh, all debate is over. Sorry, Polly, debate is over. Um, can you go ahead, uh, Councilmember Peck, and restate your motion? Just yes. so we all understand. So, if all conversations with the county fail in letting us temporarily use a space, regardless of where it is, for people living in RVs who would like to be part of the coordinated entry, system. If those fail, I would like to put a temporary halt on our LDC code prohibiting RV lots in Longmont so that our staff can look for a place in Longmont for these, these small group of people to parks until we find them housing. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. okay. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. 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 
All right, raise your hand if you're an I. All right, passes four to three with council members Christensen, Peck, Hidalgo Faring, and Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez uh, for, and myself and Councilmember Martin and Dr. Waters against. All right, Councilmember Christensen. Well, I had in mind that I would discuss something else first, but I, okay. I've, I have looked at the packet as we all have. It strikes me as a bizarre and uh, overly lengthy uh, way of trying to solve the problem. The focus is that we do not want people sleeping and living in RVs on our streets. Those are the only pro people that we are concerned with. And we don't, I don't want the rest of the people in the city who own construction vans, uh, construction vehicles, um, RVs that they use as recreational vehicles once or twice a year. I don't want all of those people to have to worry about anything because they haven't done anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with parking your construction vehicle full of tools across the street or on the street in front of your house if you want to. If your neighbors don't care, why should the city care? Nobody is living in those vehicles. Um, so I looked up uh, Boulder and Louisville because they're in the county and because they're towns like us. Um, and I think Louisville has a very simple and decent um, focused law that says, quote, no bus, trailer, coach, or mobile home, self-propelled, I sent you all this this afternoon. No bus, trailer, coach, or mobile home, self-propelled motor home, trailer, or recreational vehicle shall be, um, or any recreational equipment of any kind shall be used for living, sleeping, or residing on any street or public right of way within the city. I would also add public park. The foregoing prohibition shall not, well, the second part of this is um, something that I don't agree with. It says the foregoing prohibition shall not apply to sleeping within a recreational vehicle for more, no more than 14 nights with any six month period on a public street in front of a residence with that resident's permission. Um, we already have that resolved with a seven day uh, permit that people can get for their guests and then they can extend that once. And frankly, who wants their relatives living in front of their house for more than seven days? I think it's, you know, they can always use it as an excuse like, well, the city won't let you live there. So, you know, you'll have to leave. You can only stay for seven days. Anyway, I think this law focuses solely on the problem, which is people living in their vehicles and sleeping in their vehicles. That's the only problem that we have with RVs. We don't need to, as Mr. Flowers said, um, we don't need to make exceptions, create a very uh, complicated system, which we have in the laws presented to us whereby we make a very complicated bunch of laws and then we give exceptions to this, just have one law that states that people cannot sleep, live or reside in their vehicle on the public streets of Longmont. Do I have a second? <coughs> I'll second it. All right. The, uh, I guess what I'd ask is, is, is Commander Sat Deputy Commander Satter here? Didn't he have a presentation for us tonight? Yeah, can, we, can we have that presentation before we vote on this, please? Hello, I'm, I'm on. And uh, I'm here with Tim Hull, who's with the uh, City Attorney's Office, Shannon Stadler, and Nathan Schultz. And we were part of the committee that worked on this issue around the RV ordinance. And um, I, I just heard the recommendations, but I, I think it's a little more complicated than that because if, if it just 
prohibits sleeping, then we got to catch them in their sleeping. And that's one of the reasons why we wrote the ordinance the way we did. A lot of thought has gone into this ordinance because there, there are, are consequences with words and situations. And, and Tim may be able to answer some of this too. Uh, but it, we spent a lot of time really looking at the words to make sure it's legal, constitutionally fair and correct. And, and, and there are, are consequences for our officers and our staff. If it's just sleeping in a vehicle or something like that, it just causes consequences that how do you prove that? How do, so that's why we wrote the ordinance the way we did. But uh, Shannon has a nice presentation all ready to go. Um, and so I'd like to hand it off to her to go through it really quick. But I, I would just like to add a lot of work has gone into trying to get our wording into a spot that's enforceable and clear for everybody involved. And uh, we're not trying to eliminate the homeowner that has an RV from parking it in front of his house to unload it. That's not the intent and our ordinance makes that clear same with the uh, cargo trailers and things like that. Anyway, I'll hand it off to Shannon if that's all right. Uh, Mayor, council members, Shannon Stadler, code enforcement manager with the city. Um, Heather, if you don't mind going to slide two, thank you. Um, so the proposed amendments as uh, deputy Chief Satter said, we have worked on these for probably close to a year um, to get everything vetted legally um, and also to make it, to make sure that, um, you know, it's not a burdensome ordinance for staff to enforce either. Um, I'd, I'd like to interject here that just since the 1st of September, code enforcement in my office has received 45 complaints on sleeper vehicles on public streets and parks locations. And this is in addition to any of the complaints that were made directly to the police department. Um, my staff, you know, council represents the residents of the city, but I feel my staff represents the residents who call in looking for resolution to their concerns and that we've worked long and hard to come up with an am amendments to our code that are legally enforceable. Uh, Heather, next slide, please. So the goals of the proposed code amendments are to facilitate better use of limited staff resources when dealing with repeat violations. Um, we get calls a lot of times on the same recreational vehicles that just move around and we found that the current iteration of the code where they only have to move 600 feet um, resulted in us responding to the same RVs just 600 feet away. Secondly, it's to improve the public health and safety on public rights of way and public property. As we've discussed before, um, the leaking of sewage, the trash that is left behind um, when people are living on streets uh, can present quite a problem environmentally. Uh, we have to have, call out public works um, on many occasions to clean up the sewage that's left behind in the streets. And thirdly, to allow for the judicious use of public rights of way in the manner for which they were intended. Public right of ways were never designed and are not appropriate as permanent places for people to live. Heather, next slide, please. First amendment, um, legal, defi further defined as sleeper vehicle to include the terms recreational vehicle and any vehicle that's been converted to serve as temporary living or sleeping accommodations. So like if school buses, old Greyhound buses, things like that have, that have been converted for sleeping accommodations. Next slide. 
A sleeper vehicle would no longer have 48 hour allowance to be on the public street or public property unless a permit is issued or if the sleeper vehicle is actively being loaded or unloaded. A sleeper vehicle would no longer have the ability to move from one public location 600 feet away once it's been notified that they're in violation. So they would need to get a notification from code enforcement or the police department that they um, cannot be on the street. And that would give them time to make arrangements to move to private property or to move somewhere else out of the city. Next slide, please. Any vehicle other than a sleeper vehicle would still have a 48 hour allowance when left on public rights of way or public property without moving before it would be considered an abandoned or publicly kept vehicle. And in your, uh, in the council com, I did include standard operating procedures that both the police department, code enforcement and parking enforcement follow when we're notifying someone that they're in violation of uh, any code really, but particularly in this case, the abandoned vehicle code. Um, we have red tags that we put on vehicles, um, you know, notifications that people get that give them plenty of time to figure out how to come into compliance. And then also um, bona fide contractor trailers would be exempt from the 48 hour allowance while at an active job site up to a period not to exceed 180 days. Next slide, please. State or city vehicles or contractors are exempt from provisions of the code while in the performance of official duties under state or city authorization. And then we further defined active loading or unloading to prohibit unloading to a right of way, a greenway or a park. Next slide, please. Another amendment to the code would be that the sleeper vehicle permit fee is reduced from $40 to $25. Next, the sleeper vehicle permit issuance is restricted to four seven day permits per specific vehicle, per specific applicant, anywhere in the city in a given year. Next slide, please. Sleeper vehicle permit code language was amended to, amended to prevent multiple persons from taking turns applying for a permit on the same sleeper vehicle, as well as for one person applying for multiple permits on different sleeper vehicles. Next slide, please. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the proposed amendments to chapter 1112 with the goal of creating safer streets and neighborhoods by reducing toxic waste and minimizing the negative effects of sleeper vehicles and sleeper trailers parking on public streets and public property, which in turn helps protect our valuable water resources. Next slide, thank you. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, after listening to the presentation, I uh, like this ordinance and the wording in it, so I'm going to retract my second. Okay. Councilmember Christensen. So with this ordinance, every person who has an RV in this city has to go get a permit to have an RV that they can occasionally park on the street to clean it out. And any contractor cannot have their vehicle on the street, even though their garage probably is four feet too short to fit it in their garage. And I... I you know, there are many, many people in this town who are contractors who have vehicles that they keep their tools in. This address, it does not address them at all. They are not sleeping in it. They're not doing anything. They're parking it in front of their house because it doesn't fit in their driveway and it doesn't fit in their garage. There are a lot of people who have gigantic RVs who don't fit in their driveway either. So, um, 
what are what how does this address those i believe we have uh some answers to that so hold on one second um miss stadler uh so council member christensen um so in the first part of your question about the contractor vehicles this ordinance does not address contractor vehicles. It only talks to contractor trailers. So the regular vehicle, like a painter van or anything like that is treated exactly the same as any other passenger vehicle that's left on the street for too long. Um, so, and all of these provisions in the code um, are mostly dependent on complaints. Um, we have no, we do not even have close to the amount of staff that would be able to address just driving around the city and looking for, um, you know, or even noticing that something had been on the street too long. Most of these are dependent on complaints that we would get. So a contractor vehicle um, would just be treated like a, a car that got left on the street for too long. They would get a, a notification and they would be advised that they needed to move it to a slightly different location. They don't, they're not required, they're not required to remove it completely. Mayor? I would. It is part of their, I mean, what if this is a permanent thing that they use every day and they park it in front of their house every day? So if and they if move it- And if someone on the block complains, then they have to move it. This or they have to get rid of it. So the law. Go Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Shannon. So the so, the, so a vehicle's not abandoned if it does if it moves. So it would have to sit unmoving for forty eight hours to be considered right. abandoned. If they drive it every day, it's not a violation. Mayor, Mayor. go ahead, Harold. Um, I'm going to ask Tim to jump in on this one. So if you um, and I can't see the page numbers online. Um, if you look at, if you go to the draft ordinance on page two, um, Tim, help me clarify this. So the, the language you struck in red is already in the existing ordinance, correct? Yeah, so you'll, you'll see um, Mayor and, and, and members of council, Tim Hall, Assistant City Attorney. Um, you, you'll see in that section, there was some rearranging that took place that looks like a bunch of redlining um and so it's not necessary necessarily true that if it's red it's out um so the contractor's vehicle provisions the contractor trailer provisions were in the existing ordinance those are unchanged they just move so so that was i think one of the points i wanted to make in the ordinance is the 48 hours it is in the existing ordinance today for four contractors in terms of their vehicles and how we deal with it. Um, it's not a new piece of the ordinance that's being added in this. And like Shannon said, is when they're moving their cars, this is not anything that gets police attention or code enforcement attention. It's when it's left somewhere for multiple days in a row that people start complaining. But a, a contractor that's working daily is moving his car daily and that that's not going to get any attention from from a neighbor. So, so what, what I'm hearing, Councilmember Christensen, is that I think everybody agrees with your concerns, but the ordinance addresses them. Uh, Councilmember Peck. Well, Council so I do I do have a question about that 48 hours when you say it's left there for 48 hours and hasn't moved. Um, what is the, what does the do the police do? For example. Um, you know, we had a situation where we had cars that didn't move for weeks because my husband was ill. Do you just ticket that? Or do you go to the home and ask for an explanation? If someone's, if someone's on vacation and, and the car sits there, right. I, I have a problem and this probably goes to, uh, to the police department basically and what what you inform police to do. Are there individual police that would automatically ticket or tow an automobile that has sat there without 
without uh, contacting the person. I think that that is really kind of what we're getting to. How detailed is this ordinance? It doesn't really say, it just says if it hasn't moved in 48 hours. Um, so um, as you know, there's 340 miles of roadway in this city, um, thousands and thousands of cars. Right. Uh, a police are not aware of every car that's parked in a home. So uh, we would not, we don't just drive down the street and, and run a license plate to see where the car belongs. Right. It's usually based on a neighbor calling and saying, hey, there's a car with parked on my street. It hasn't moved for a couple of weeks. Uh, an officer would go over there, run the plate. If the plate came back to the home, they would inform the, the complainant, hey, the car belongs to the home. And they may even attempt contact with the homeowner, but they they likely would do nothing with that because the car's with that home. Now, if the car registered to Boulder, uh, they would make contact at the home and ask, hey, do you know whose car this is? They would put a sticker on the car that says the car needs to be moved within 48 hours, and then they would come back at a later date, uh, and often it's not within 48 hours just because of volume of calls for service to check if the car is there. If the car wasn't there at that point, they could potentially tow the car. But if the car belongs to a homeowner, we're not towing those cars off the street, unless it's some junk kind of car. But if, if it's a registered car, we're going to make an attempt to, to talk to the homeowner and at least put some sort of notice. But we don't just drag cars off the street in front of owners' houses, that okay. that would be that would be a, a very rude and impolite, and a not very social for our police department. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yes. All right, let's go ahead and go, Councilmember Dago Faring, because her fingers are moving fastest, and then we're going to go with Dr. Waters. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you. So I actually I have a couple of questions. So one, so I had heard um, that. Um, Stadler, Shannon Stadler had stated that 48 complaints that your office has received, 48, 45 complaints, sorry, about approximately how many does the um, public safety? I, I think the last time we, number? yeah, yeah, I think the last time we, we talked, uh, I counted and we were right around 150. And that was when we talked about this the last time we presented this. As you know, you sent me a complaint today. Uh, I also got a complaint from that same neighborhood from uh, Polly Christensen a couple weeks ago. So our, uh, that vehicle moved on uh, for whatever reason. I don't know if it got tagged, but now it's back in the same neighborhood and we're going to go back and tag that car again. So many of our cars, like Shannon said, get tagged over and over and over again. And we just chase them around town. And so it's it's one car gets tagged multiple times and nothing happens with those cars. Okay. Uh, so that leads to those numbers of vehicles that, like I said, we were in the 150 range um, when we talked about this at, in September, I believe it was. So it's so, kind of staying, hovering at that over 100 complaints yeah, it's, pretty regularly. Yeah, by the end of the year, it, it's significant. Okay. Okay. And then the other yeah. question. So in response to um, the public invited to be heard comment, um, Mr. Fowler, who has the RV in his home. Mm -hmm. So if he parked that in front of his house, that's, those aren't kind of the vehicles that you're receiving complaints about. Is that? Um, that's, that's correct. And, and, and neighbors know their neighbors. And if, if somebody called, let's say somebody called in Mr. Fowler's RV, uh -huh. And an officer, a code enforcement officer would go there. We'd run the plate and see that it belongs to that house. And we'd have a conversation. And, you know, those aren't the ones that we're, we're, we get complaints about. It's the mm -hmm. one that has the lawnmower that is left in the yard. All the trash that you sent me pictures of. Mm -hmm. They're parked on some side street. They're parked in a neighborhood. Yeah. And they're dumping all their trash in that neighborhood. They, we don't get calls from a homeowner. That, that 
mm -hmm. is unloading their car or they have it parked in the street overnight because they're letting their refrigerator. Those are uh, very uncommon. And when we do get them, the car lists to that residence. And that's where the permits also help if, if you have a guest that wants to come into town and mm -hmm. stay at your home for a week, you can do that under this ordinance. And again, we would know there's a permit and officer would have a conversation. And even if we threw a tag on it, the person would say, hey, I have a permit. And, and it's like, oh, sorry about that. And it, but well, I think a lot of this too is also educating the public to know <laughs> who's going to be affected by this ordinance who isn't, who's in the, you know, who's pretty safe with right. this ordinance. And if the RV is tied to that house, the, those aren't the vehicles we're looking at. So yeah. council, council member Hidalgo Faring. Yes. I, I get a fair amount of calls in, in my code enforcement uh, office from people asking that particular question. Grandma and grandpa are coming in. What should I do? You know? And the first thing I tell them is go let your neighbors know Mm -hmm. that you're going to have visitors. If they know that they that RV is tied to your house and they're, they're your visitors, nobody's going to call about it. Mm -hmm. So right. they've all, you've already alleviated the, the need for a permit, mm -hmm. right? And your neighbors know who's there. They, they know how long they're going to be there. All's good. Mm -hmm. Like, like yep. Jeff said, we, there's, no, there's no reason for us to even respond to anything like that. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. I, I move that we accept the changes proposed in the in the packet we received for tonight's meeting. And we direct staff to bring them back to us in the form of an ordinance for first reading at a subsequent council meeting. Second. All right. Is there additional debate on the matter, Council Member? Uh, uh, sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, so basically, my reading of everything so far and listening to the explanations provided to us by staff uh, is that there aren't the kind of loopholes or oversights that Councilmember Christensen is concerned with. I think she has a different reading of it, which is fair. Um, and until we actually see, without red lines and, and some of those things, seeing the actual first reading draft ordinance, uh, it'll be harder for maybe some of us to to read it in a way that doesn't show kind of some of these these loopholes or unintended consequences that could happen. Uh, but I don't think that at this time, wordsmithing it when legal and staff are saying that uh, all items are essentially covered both for the sleeper vehicles as well as for non-sleeper vehicles and the contingencies thereof. So I'd rather see the non-redlined version or the first for first reading and then if we do still see these holes that we can make those decisions at that time instead of trying to over wordsmith at this time so i would agree with uh council member waters as far as moving forward this also as as a explanation to the public as far as my vote is this on this is concerned i've said for a long time to folks that i've met with on the subject that I would support basically this concept of, of this ordinance that we're moving forward as long as we were finding uh, that kind of support for those folks that need it, it who are in RVs. And while it wasn't everything I wanted out of it, uh, oftentimes perfect is the enemy of the good. And I think that we got a lot of good things in here and that we're also doing a good thing for the folks uh, by finally addressing this, because it has been a long time coming. Because I remember when the original ordinance was passed, which was prior to my election, uh, over uh, nearly three years ago. So, uh, with that, I'll, I'll support the motion to move it forward. And I don't, I don't expect anything else from my colleagues here on council. That we'll take a good hard look at that ordinance when it comes through and try to see if there are any holes in it uh, at that time as well. So, All right, well, I'm, I'm going to call on Councilmember Christensen, but is anyone opposed to voting after Councilmember Christensen speaks? Okay, Councilmember Christensen. Okay, my other objection to this is it 
it includes a, a section on un unregistered vehicles or it includes a section on junked vehicles and that um, includes uh, unregistered vehicles. Unregistered vehicles are not junked vehicles. And for someone to have their car towed, as has happened to me, um, when they are merely a couple of months out of, uh, have, have failed to um, renew their registration, which um, I know the mayor also failed to renew his registration a few years ago. This is easy for all of us to do. The postcard slides under all the other bills that don't get paid. And instead of dealing with it right away, which is what you should do, you forget and then you, you're out of compliance, you don't remember at all. Um, I would like to change this law so that unregistered vehicles are a separate category, which is just something that you get a ticket for not have your car towed for, which is something that the ordinance as it stands now allows people to, allows the officer at their own discretion to tow this. Um, Tim Hole or someone wrote us back about this uh, a while ago and said, yes, under that law, you, you can um, tow a vehicle for being out of uh, registration. I believe that's uh, theft, frankly, and I, I don't think that you should be allowed to tow a vehicle under any circumstances because it is a couple of months uh, beyond its registration date. I think that should be a separate category called unregistered vehicles and they should be given a ticket and um, I sent you the information that Louisville has on unregistered vehicles. And um, I believe that should be taken out. I, uh, I, I believe I know what you're gonna say, but Ms. Stadler, can you go ahead and say what you're gonna say? Um, so Mayor and Council Member Christensen, um, I've worked for the city for 23 years. This code 1112050 has been on the books at least that long. Mm -hmm. It has not changed. We are not changing it. We just included it. I believe Tim could mm -hmm. address why it was included. Um, but that's because this whole uh, chapter, 1112, is being amended. So we had to include 1112.050. Okay. Um, but that's that's not a new code. That's been on the books for at least 22 no. years, probably longer. Yes. And we, what we, the SOP that I included in the council com for junked, vehicles on public streets includes the fact and Je Jeff can concur with this we typically write a parking ticket to them first right. they, they get a parking ticket and if they're still there on the street a couple days later with the parking ticket on it then they may get towed but that the first course of action is usually a parking ticket for expired plates but the code does not say that there must be a ticket issued and that's because there are there's discretionary um, use of the code depending on the circumstances. Every circumstance is different. One junk vehicle may be a hazard in the street, and would you not want it towed if it was a hazard? Yes. So it's in front of your house, and it is towed with no warning on a Friday afternoon, and you have to pay the fees for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and Monday. It's very expensive. Well, I think and that's without like a warning. particular situation that happened to just. I'm going yes. that, that, to actually cut us off. Yeah. That, that's a that's okay. a different issue than the ordinance that's currently on the agenda. If somebody wants to bring it up on some future. I'll case, bring it up another time. All right, Dr. Waters, do you have something to say on this? I was just going to ask, but I'll, I, there's a motion on the floor. I understand yeah, the that, concern. That, 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 yeah, that, 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 that was, that's why I cut it off. And so, I mean, does anyone, I'm not going to call the question, but can we vote? All right, there's a motion on the Ford floor that was eloquently stated, basically saying, let's direct staff to move forward and prepare an ordinance based on the presentation or recommendation by the, the, the staff. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, very complicated topic, but all in all, it was fairly painless. So thanks. Yes.
Thank you, everyone. Um, all right, now we're going to go on to uh, Councilmember Christensen. Okay, one, one more thing. Um, the reason B&B uh, uh, Park was brought up is because a friend of mine went down there to see if he could park an R RV there. The man who owns the park told him, who seems to think that he lives in Boulder County, told him that Boulder County has a policy. He's been trying for several years to expand his park, which could be double the size. Boulder County will not issue him a permit to do that. And he went to, and that's where he thinks he lives. So <clears throat> we need, what I would um, move is that staff consult with Boulder County and Weld County to be sure that they are not banning uh, uh, issuing of permits for RV parks. Trying to get one within the city limits of Longmont is problematic because we don't have a lot of space, but there is a lot of county land and Boulder County needs to take some responsibility for the fact that we are getting an a heavy load of recreational vehicles because they've been banned in Louisville, they've been banned in Boulder, they've been banned all over. So we're getting them and they need to take some responsibility for issuing new permits to RV parks. So hold on one second. So I guess I would question, no one seconded it, but hear me out before somebody throws it a second. Harold, can you just choose an email on, on what the Weld and Boulder County's policy is on issuing new RV uh, uh, parks and facilities. Can somebody on staff do that fairly quickly? Yeah, we can do that. And as I stated earlier to the point, that's one of the things I want to look at because it doesn't make sense. And I think we need to talk to this individual and, okay. and help facilitate that conversation. All right. So now we are now going to move on to uh, C, but let's take a two minute break and talk specifically about proposed changes to, lo and behold, impounded, abandoned, public collapsed, and junk vehicles. You've already done that. That's it? Yeah. Um, I thought that, oh, duh, sorry. You're right, great. So thanks, Dr. Waters. I was gonna say, that's the motion we just- No, 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 yeah, 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 no, I'm sorry. I was just read it. it. Hey, it's 10 o'clock. I'm way like an hour ahead. All right, so anything else, Harold, from you on that particular issue, we done? All right, so okay. Mayor, I meant, now we're excited for Mayor Cal's comments. All right, anybody? All right, great. Um, I guess the only thing I would say is that uh, 22 years ago today, Matthew Shepard was beaten to death. And uh, unfortunately, we continue to uh, deal with the types of discrimination that he suffered. So, uh, um, man, it's going to be, I, I don't want to be mayor on November, on November 5th. And I just hope that as we continue this election season, the uh, with COVID and with our politics, um, I just hope we all remember that we're saying we're all we're all part of the same human family, and I hope that uh, you know things just somehow get better because uh, the world, at least I think, is just really ugly lately. So love all you guys and respect you all. So even though occasionally um, we don't agree on politics or or uh, specific ordinances. So, Council Member Dago Ferry. You reminded me. Um, also, be nice to your public school teachers. We're no, going no, through no, a lot not right that, now. Not that. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I, I spent a four hour and 50 minute conversation with a teacher helping her talk off, talking her off the ledge. It's, it's a tough time and it is an unreal year. What a year to be on council. <laughs> So yeah, but thanks for your words. I appreciate it. All right, anybody else? All right, great. And the city manager, Harold, you got anything else? I got two things. You reminded me of one mayor. I know we're getting questions about um, how we're being, how we're preparing for uh, the election and what potentially could happen. And so Rob is working on that with the other chiefs in Boulder County. Um, He's gonna provide you all with a general outline. We obviously aren't gonna talk about specifics. Um, and then we will talk about reaching out to you all with more, uh, you know, as, as more details come together. But I did wanna confirm that he is working on that issue with the other chiefs. The other thing I wanted to say, in case you all see this, I just saw it on CNN, um, Regal Theaters actually just announced that they are 
closing all of their facilities. It's not a permanent closure, it's a temporary closure um, based on the um, how they're moving the openings of movies. So if, if you see that here locally, that is a corporate wide decision and it's on a, based on the articles an interim basis until they start releasing some of the new films. I just know how people sometimes can get that information. I just want to let you all know. And speaking of which, they've got two good mu movies. New Mutants was good if you like superhero mu mu uh, movies, Marsha. And then Tenant, you can have to see twice to truly enjoy it. It's good. So yeah, one day you've got you've got to go. You've only got so many so many hours left, people. Councilmember Christensen, you're on mute. Okay, it's very sad. Thank God for Netflix, but um, uh, with that said we also have alfalfa's opening up within a couple of weeks so that's terrific it's, I'm, I'm very grateful that they have faith in us and that they're have the guts to do something like that uh, in at a time like this so that's something good for this town no more comments mayor all right great eugene no comments mayor well we appreciate that all right do we have a motion to adjourn so move. Second. All right. All in favor. We have a motion to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. It passes unanimously. We'll see you all at least next Tuesday. Thanks, guys. And uh, Deputy Chief, thank you so much. All right. Bye. <laughs>